City Council Committee on Finance will please come to order. The clerk will call the roll. Councilor Shadim. Dion? Here. Hart? Here. Kilby? Here. Herrera? Here. Ponte? Here. Raposo? Here. Sampson? Here. President Kamara? Here. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit this meeting to any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present, and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. We have two individuals assigned up for citizens' input time. First is Richard Barlow, subject matter. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Come down, Mr. Barlow. Thank you. That makes two of us, Mr. Barlow. Thank you. I remind anyone since this what time you have three minutes. Good afternoon, Council. Council President Richard Ball of 50 Anderson Street. Good afternoon. How many of you know how long I've been coming down here complaining about my flooding issues? Two years. Longer than that. A, long, a lot longer, longer than, than that. that. <laughs> and I'm pleased to say thanks to Mr. Perlin. We came out there. He went out there with me. We took a look. It took me hours and hours. But we found the pipes that have been blocked mm -hmm. since 2010. Wow. So I'd just like to say... Thank you to Mr. Perlin there you go. and his team. <laughs> I'd also like to thank the mayor who gave the funding to Mr. Perlin to do the studies that are needed for, um, for getting back there because the, this project isn't, is far from being over. Um, it needs to be done from downstream up. I mean, so, I mean, if everybody can see the presentation that he put on, it, it's, it'd, be, it'd be good because we need the funding to get that whole entire thing done. It's not only going to improve my yard, it's also going to improve Dickinson Street and Spencer Street because now all that water that was all combined over there trying to get through that one pipe is, it just doesn't, didn't work. And for some reason, the city didn't know those pipes were there. 50, they're about there 50 years, one of the pipes in 1975. So I'm figuring almost 50 years that those pipes have been there. <clears throat> Three pipes. Unfortunately, they keep getting clogged up because of the, there's so much debris in that water. We pulled out tires. I called Mr. Frillin. He got the crew right back out there again and cleaned it up again. That's one thing I can say about him. Um, he's been, you know, right on the ball. If I ever called him, you know, he does everything he can. So I have no, um, uh, I don't, I'm trying to say the word. I'm, uh, I don't know what to say. I guess well, you're right. I'm you not, didn't know what I'm to say. I'm not sign. upset with, with this administration. I'm not upset with Mr. Ferlin because this was way before his time. So as far as you know, he knew, that's just the way it was supposed to be. But as was, I was always saying, it was that water is not inside the stream. It took a right-hand turn in Albuquerque, like Bugs Bunny would say. You know, but when he said that, I'll be more than happy to go out there with you, I felt like a little kid on Christmas morning. So I got up Saturday morning with my chainsaw and everything else, and I made a path all the way back there. That's how I know nobody's ever been back there. So I dug and I dug and I kept going until I found the pipes and I found them and he came out there with me and the next day it was cleaned up and I'm very thankful for that. Three, almost three inches of rain and no water in my yard. Good. I'm very happy. And I wanna thank each and every one of you who always supported the resolutions um, that were set forth, uh, Councilor Dion and Councilor Kamau who put the last resolutions in and got the updates on what was going on, so I appreciate that very much. So, that's awesome. For not knowing what to say, you said it very well. Council C4, <laughs> Council Kilby. Yeah, really quick, no questions, but um, it's really nice to see um, a citizen like yourself who's been aggrieved so long over an issue like that come to say thank you because 99.9% .9 of the time we have people come before us with um, obviously complaints, some well-founded, some that have to get sifted through. So I'm really, really uh, smiling that uh, this got done. Council President and kudos to Council Dan for pushing, for pushing this. Um, and you finally received some relief. And Mr. Furlan, that's what Department Ed should be doing, uh, listening to the council and, and, uh, and pushing an issue. And, and I'm really happy, I'm happy for you. Thank so uh, hopefully the city and the legal department, council president, will do some type of subrogation to maybe recoup the funds um, through anyone, uh, any developer, whatever that, that maybe caused this problem. 
Well, I, I think know, it was maybe. just mainly from 2010, that storm just wiped out. It just yeah. clogged that up, and what they did over there, it looks like they put a bunch of big rocks down there so it doesn't yeah. wash out again. And uh, like I said, they did a, they did a but, great job. And yeah. but I mean, really, it still really, needs attention, but... Um, but really quick, I'm so... I'm, I'm sorry. I hope I'm, I'm so... Uh, we all are. It's rewarding for us to see that um, a citizen like yourself who's... Um, you advocate for other people, too. Yeah. Well, I've I have seen do, it before. Yeah. <laughs> So I try. I, and, uh, I got a big heart, and, and I always try to you give some to relief. And, and uh, you know, thank you so much. So I think for that's coming what we're here for to help <coughs> out each other. Yeah. Thank you for saying thank you. So well, if I have something bad to say, I'll say. If I have something good to say, I'm going to say it. Thank and you, sir. I think it's only the right thing thank to you, do. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council. I just I don't want to get the credit for this. This is credit too to the hardworking men and women at the Water Department. They deserve all the credit for solving your issue. Kudos to them. No, Council C2, Council Dion, do you have to add something real quick? Yeah, I echo the sentiments of uh, Councilor in seat four. But um, it's nice to see a good outcome for a change. It really, truly is. But I want to thank you for your perseverance and for you not giving up and you finding the problem. Um, I never give up. <laughs> I know you don't. But because you not only helped yourself, you helped your entire neighborhood. Right. And uh, thank you to Mr. Furlan for getting out there and following up on, on what, you, what you found. Thank so, you. But one more thing. I just hope that the, um, the council will support the, um, I mean, you've seen the um, presentation that he showed. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, it needs a lot more work still. It's almost 50 years old, <coughs> not designed for what, the amount of water that's getting dumped into it today, right? I mean, 50 years ago, I mean, to now. So if um, we can get that funding together, and that would be great so we can get this together. And the water department needs an excavator, their own excavator. So if we can get one of those for those guys, too, <laughs> you know, the used one, maybe. <laughs> you're going to be on in three minutes now. <laughs> Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Nelson Vasquez, subject matter, Proposition 2 and a half. Uh, before my time starts, I would like to kindly, respectfully request a waiver of the rules, motion to waive the rules, because um, given what was said on Saturday on the radio, uh, required me to do a little bit of research about Proposition Two and a Half, and I think that the public should hear about this because, um, you know, he's uh, the mayor stated he wants a, a two and a half override for Diamond. So, I think given the information that I have, um, I'm, I'm kindly requesting to waive the rules, and and I, I won't take too long either if I'm granted that. You have three minutes, Mr. No. Okay. All right. So it t it turns out that. Uh, if a community uh, gives the exemption from Proposition Two and a Half, uh, it gives them two options, and and basically, in pack in, in your packs that I gave you, pages nine and twelve, uh, basically, it says uh, a majority vote of a community selectman or, uh, or town or city council with the mayor's approval, if required by law, allows an override question to be placed on the ballot. Override questions must be presented in dollar terms and must specify the purpose of the override. Overrides require a majority vote of approval by the electorate. Now, the second option is called an underride. Now, what is an underride? <coughs> an underride is the same thing, but in reverse. Basically, the underride results in permanent decreases in the levy limit of a community because it reduces the base upon which levy limits are calculated. A majority vote of a community selectman, town, or city council, same thing again, with the mayor's approval, if required by law, allows an underwrite, an underwrite question to be placed on the ballot, and basically it says the same thing here, and you can see it in pages 9 and 12. So why is this important? It's because that's the process. And I took the liberty of printing out the specimen ballot for Durfee, and basically it says you need to put two questions and not one, because in the first question, back in March 6th of 2018. It says, shall the city of Fall River be allowed to, ex to exempt from the pro provisions of Proposition two and, two and a half, so-called the amounts required by law, by law to pay for the bonds issued in order to build the new Derby High School. So basically what this law is saying is, is that if the community gives <coughs> the permission to be exempt, the mayor cannot choose the override and the underwrite says it can be placed on the ballot or the voters can go out by, by a uh, local initiative procedure to get it placed on the ballot. So what, what I'm saying is, 
if he's asking for a two and a half, uh, an exemption from two and a half for Diamond, then we need to go back to Durfee and ask them how they want to pay for it because there's only one question here and the public did not have the chance to vote for the underwrite. And, and given the fact that they still haven't put the, the taxes on the bills, you all saw my presentation last time. There is no excuse why he can't put it on there. You all have it. So, and again, and I just wanna say real quick, um, you know, for some time now, when it comes to nickel and diamond the taxpayer, and it's, it's gonna be up to, up to the voters if they want this or not, but we need to do the process right, and we need to revisit the, 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 the uh, Durfee question. But when it comes to the, to the taxpayers, and nickel and diamond them for so long, my question is, when is enough going to be enough? Because not too long ago, he did a speech and said that this city was in great financial shape. And then last Saturday, here we are. Groundhog Day has, has arrived, and now he wants another exemption override Thank you, Mr. for Diamond. Chris. So we need to do the process correctly. Council C2, Council VR. Yeah. Um, obviously, we'll be discussing this at a, at a future yeah. meeting. So you'll have time to get deeper into this. Yes. Um, I want to thank you for this because you saved me some research. Yeah, the library was very um, courteous. It's a, obviously it's a lot of paper. But, but I do want to mention yeah. the one thing that bothers me, and it's the only I haven't read much of this, but yeah. is the fact that a community, an override, a community can permanently increase its levy limit by successfully voting on an override. Mm -hmm. The amount of the override becomes a permanent part of the levy limit base. That's disturbing. I can understand an override for a, an item for a short time. But, it but that part bothers me, so I'll have to do more research and, uh, and, 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 and the reason to why think the, about before our meeting. And the Thank reason you. why the underwriting exists is, is, is because it's, it's supposed to protect the taxpayer, and they're supposed to choose what they want, either to vote on the override or underwrite. So if we're gonna talk about Diamond, then we need to talk about Durfee too. Thank you. Thank you, I yield. Thank you. Item number two, we have the fiscal year 2025 enterprise fund budgets for the water and sewer divisions. It was referred on March 12th. Uh, we'll hold discussion. Come down, please. Council President, may I ask a question before? Before you do that, Council, you may, but I just want to have everyone at the table please uh, identify themselves, name and address, and what <coughs> part of you would please. Yep, so Paul Perlin, Administrator of Community Utilities, One Government Center. Uh, Zach Aronson, uh, Project Manager with Woodard and Kern, uh, Environmental Engineering Consultants. Based Good evening. In, oh, sorry. <laughs> based in Canton, Mass. Uh, Dave Fox, Vice President, Ref Tellus, Natick, Massachusetts. Thank you very much. Council yeah. C4, Council Kilby. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this um, has not been to ordinance. Is that correct, Ms. Mm -hmm. Ms. Burr? So at this point, it has to go to ordinance and come back to the council for further discussion. So this is mainly a presentation. So this, we're going to hold the discussion, Council. We'll have, the, of course, we'll have the discussion, but uh, just to clarify. This, is, this is their budget, so Council, that they're presenting. Right. There, there's two portions. There's the budget and there's the rates. The rates are set in ordinance. Those would need to go to ordinance. Budget is typ typically handled in finance and then voted on by the council. Correct. It's always uh, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the rates or the budget. Uh, again, we're here uh, to present to you on our budget, which the rates support. Um, but within Mass General Law, the budget needs to be acted on within 45 days of submittal to the council. So okay. that's why we're, we're here, Some so that, that can be I can, Sometimes we need a refresher, and I just need yep. to refresh yeah, no, my fine. memory with... Uh, where the process is, and it's an important vote uh, going forward. So I, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Council Council 5 Council Vice President Pro. Uh, I just have a question. I'm sorry. I got your first name as Zach, not your last name or where you were from. Could you speak into the microphone? Uh, and I, I know am, you're Mr. David Fox, but I don't know where you're from. I don't know if my hearing is worse than my colleagues, or, but if you could repeat it, I'd, where were you from? No problem. Uh, it's Zachary Aronson, uh, A-A-R-O-N-S-O-N. Yep. Um, we, I'm from Woodard and Curtin, uh, environmental engineers. Okay. Uh, and we're based out of Canton, Mass. 
Marquette, Massachusetts. Thank you. Dave Fox, Vice President, Raftelis, R A F T E L I S. However you say it, I will have heard worse uh, pronunciations of that. Um, it's my founder's name, so you're not going to offend me. And we're out of Natick, Massachusetts. Natick. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, Councilors. Uh, presented to you uh, prior to the last meeting was this year's fiscal year budget, uh, FY25 for water and sewer. Uh, also, the uh, rates to support that budget. Um, this year, uh, as we have seen in the past, uh, this year is a, uh, is, is a tough year. There's a lot of factors that go into this year's budget uh, that we haven't had to deal with in past years, uh, and that's uh, why the budget was structured the way it is and the rates are structured the way that they are. Uh, I have both uh, Dave and uh, Zach here because uh, they, I had them come in at through one of our projects that we did, uh, the lead service project, uh, and also uh, evaluation of uh, NIFTI's permit and other um, impacts that the regulatory agencies have on us and do a financial evaluation of our budget, budget uh, look at our budget. Uh, that's really what, uh, what Dave does and his company does. They, uh, they oversee, and, and I'll let him explain a little bit to you, but they basically work with utilities, and they look at their rates, they look at their budgets. That's, that's what they do throughout the nation. Uh, I really wanted to have somebody to come in, look at our budget, look at our rates, look how things were structured to make sure that we're in the right spot, to make sure that we're doing the right thing fiscally. Um, and uh, Dave has uh, put together a presentation, which uh, I'll let him go into, uh, just about uh, the rates and the budgets and how it's structured. I think the TVs have gone to sleep. Great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll give a little bit uh, more background. Yes, my firm, Raftelis, is the, the largest firm in the country predominantly focused on financial planning and rate-related matters. Uh, for water and sewer utilities, we do some other things, but that is our bread and butter. It's certainly my area of expertise and what I've spent my entire career on. Um, I've performed over, well over 100 rate studies at this point in my career. Um, it's been a pleasure working with Paul and, and the entire water and sewer department, uh, as well as water and current on this project. So um, I do have a, a handful of slides here. Uh, I'm going to try to get through them as efficiently as I possibly can, but I really want to set the stage for what we're talking about this evening. So to do that, um, really just wanted to give an overview of what a rate study is to, to really set that stage. Um, the purpose of this is to uh, evaluate the existing financial con conditions of the water and the sewer funds, um, understand where they are financially currently, uh, and then we, we take that into the future, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, we're really trying to ensure the the short and long-term financial sustainability, which in turn ensures the operational sustainability of the water and sewer funds for the city of Fall River, um, ensuring that the water and sewer department has enough revenue on an annual basis to do what it needs to do to keep up with operating expenses, capital reinvestment, uh, ensure reliability, quality, and safety of service for residents, uh, not only today, but well into the future. Um, and unfortunately, we're in a very capital-intensive industry, uh, especially here in the Northeast, where we have a lot of aging infrastructure um, and the need to renew and replace that infrastructure to ensure that uh, we are keeping up with uh, you know, ensuring that reliability and that quality of service for, um, for all residents of, of Fall River. Um, but it's not lost on us. Um, I've gone to too many public hearings at this point in my career to understand that there are impacts on customers of generating additional revenue. So we want to understand what those impacts are. Um, and we have a bunch of uh, slides at the tail end of the presentation. We break this down into a dollars and cents basis because when we talk about percentage increases, it doesn't really translate in what that's going to mean for, a, um, for customers in terms of the bills they're actually paying. Um, a little bit of context, just want to let you know, uh, water and sewer rates have increased across the country by about 5 and 6 percent, percent uh, respectively, over the last 20 years or so. Every single year, they've gone up by about 5 or 6 percent, um, twice or more than twice the rate of inflation over that same period. Um, that's predominantly due to just what I was already talking about, aging infrastructure, the need to renew and replace, Matt, replace that. Um, 
increase regulations on water and sewer, which seem to be changing and updating and coming, you know, coming out almost on a daily basis at this point. Um, certainly recently, inflationary impacts, right? It's not just hitting us at our, at our homes and our wallets and pocketbooks. It, it's, it's hitting water and sewer utilities as well. Um, and if that wasn't an uphill battle enough in terms of cost increases, our revenue base has been declining um, pretty, pretty much nationwide due to just uh, reductions in consumption. You have uh, water and sewer has a very uh, high amount, and we're going to get into this a little bit. The revenue is contingent upon the amount of water customers are using. Um, and if they use less water, that's less revenue that's coming in the door. Um, and just by the, you know, the advent of, of high efficiency fixtures, low flow toilets, low flow shower heads, low flow wash machines, things like that, there's been reductions in per capita consumption, reducing the revenue base at the same time that costs are increasing by a, a, a significant amount on an annual basis. So, uh, and the city of Fall River is not alone in that boat. Um, it's very much an industry-wide issue uh, hitting every single one of my clients and most water and sewer utilities across the country. Um, to, to talk about that, and I'll, I'll turn this slide over um, to either Paul or Zach is just um, this is showing some of the historical me uh, material costs going back to 2020, and you can see some of the you know the astronomical increases through 2024. You know some in the the triple digits, but most in the high double digits. Um, Zach or Paul, I don't know if you want to speak to this a little bit more. Yeah, if you want, I'll talk a little bit to it. So this is just some standard items that we go out to bid for every single year. Um, you know, 10 inch duct line pipe. Back in 2020, the bid price was 29.60 uh, per foot. Uh, last year, the bid price was up to $52.06 per foot. Typical fire hydrant. Um, back in 2020, uh, $1,825. And I do apologize for not having printed versions for uh, the council. I'll make sure in the future I do. Um, in last year's bid was uh, was $3,042. So. Uh, close to double. Uh, we were just informed by our, our current low bidder supplier that they expect a $600 uh, increase per hydrant this coming, fis this coming fiscal year when we go out to bid. Um, going on to, uh, there's, there's a number of other things up there. One of the big things, sodium hypochlorite, which we use both on water and wastewater side. Uh, that's the chemical that's added to on the water side, kill any of the parasites or anything within the water to disinfect it, uh, as well as on the wastewater side when we discharge it out into the bay to kill any of the bacteria that's in that water before we discharge it into the bay. Uh, that went from about 70 cents per gallon uh, up to do $2.14 per gallon. And those are last year's numbers just on the bids. Um, so again, these are just some of the increases that we're dealing with. Uh, with just the raw materials that we have to do. And it's not like we can add any less sodium hypochlorite in, into the water or into the uh, sewage to disinfect it. Uh, we need to meet those minimum standards by, by uh, the federal requirements. Thanks, Paul. Um, this slide is, is representing... Do, do uh, a couple of councils raise their hands? Do you guys mind if they ask their questions now? Or? I'll wait until they ask. You'll wait? I'll okay. Do you want to wait too or you want to ask now? If you don't mind, I'd like to ask now. So, I don't see too. You can ask a question. <laughs> so I believe I understood you to say that efforts have been made <coughs> to reduce water consumption by having shower heads that use less water and different, which affects the revenue for the water department because the consumption is lower because we're conserving water, which is what people want us to do. But Everything else has gone up in price, so the increase in rates is compensating for lower water usage. Am I understanding this correctly? So in essence, <laughs> we're penalized for saving water. Uh, yes, it's a double-edged sword. Um, with, with a predominantly volumetric revenue stream, which I'm about to get into here, um, on this slide, uh, yes, as customers, if uh, Citywide, if consumption declines and it persists, it's not just, you know, we see fluctuations from year to year predominantly due to weather and those ups and downs, the peaks and valleys. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about persistent reductions in consumption. If we continue to bill based on water consumption, which is the, the industry best practice for billing for water and sewer service, there should be a fixed charge component. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, yes, as consumption reduces, it is increasing rates more so than it would be if that consumption stayed flat. 
Thank you, Council. Council C5, Council Vice President Perver. Can you just go back one slide? Because the percentages that I'm seeing on here, you're not going from what it was. Look at the 10-inch duck fight. In 23, it was 75-29. And in 24, it's 52. You're, you're showing the percentage of increase from 20 to 24. Not yes. Not what the increase is from last year to this year. Some of them went down. Know what I mean? We're showing the increase from 2020 to or 2021 if we don't have data for 2020 through 2024. Yes. Okay, but you have for 23 and 24, you have up there. Yes, but right? we're showing over the last five years how right. those so prices the have changed. Are over the last five years. Yes. Not what the yeah. increase was from like last year to this year. What your materials go up, the different chemicals that you put in, what they were from last year, what they were to this year, because Last year, and I remember Mr. Furlan coming down, and the years that we had COVID, it was difficult to get stuff so much so that we don't even put fluoride in the water anymore, which some people look at that as being good. Other people look at it as being bad. It's kind of one That's of those a things. supply chain issue. But, um, you know, some of the cost of chemicals now have come yeah. down. I don't know if they'll go up again if we have... Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. This slide is showing the percentage increase from right. the first year that we have of data, either 2020 or 2021 through 2024. Uh, sodium hypochlorite, for example, that's showing a 207% two, increase from 2021 to 2024. If we look at the increase from 2023 to 2024, it's about a 31% increase right. in one year. Yeah, yeah the, the comparison, the percentages, I was just thrown off because the percentages that you're showing is from, you know, 2020. <clears throat> Everything from 2020 has gone up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything. Uh, so, I, I totally that's agree, and that's still like a even with a five a five year set of increases, a 76 percent increase over five years is still significant. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, everything's gone up. A loaf of bread has gone up. A dozen of eggs have gone up. So I used to get them for 69 cents on sale or 89 cents. Now it's over two dollars. Yeah, I got Again. rid of my backyard chickens a little but too early. From <laughs> last year to this year. What are my price of eggs gone up? You know what I mean? So to have those percentages, just I was confused. Thank you. You're welcome. You can continue. Any other questions before I keep going? Do nope. you have a printout of this for us to maybe like? Just he said he didn't bring one, Council. He'll get he'll get yeah, we'll get I do, one. I do apologize. I'll I'll get nope. the council. Yeah, no apology necessary. Print but Council right. Ferrer has a legitimate point, but I mean, <laughs> no. if she gets a copy, she can just do the percentage right. increases. I had an eye exam and they dilated my eyes, Ooh. so it's difficult. Me well, uh, that's why I have my back turned. Thank nope, you for your concern. Right. Please Dr. proceed, Dr. gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, fixed versus volumetric, both expenses and revenue on the uh, left side here is the Water and Sewer Department's expenses. About 90% of the expenses that they incur on an annual basis are fixed, which means they do not, it does not matter whether customers use no water consumption or they use all the water consumption. Those costs are, are predominantly staying the exact same. Um, there's very little that can be done, and by that I mean nothing that can be done to reduce those expenses. We're talking about things like salaries, um, debt service. Um, there's, you know, about 10% of those expenses which do uh, change slightly with, with water consumption, the amount of demand on the system, things like electric and chemicals and things like that. Um, but they don't, they, they don't change very much. And if we compare that to the revenue side of things, and this is getting back to my point earlier, um, it's actually the inverse where about 80% you know, uh, of our revenue is coming from volumetric. It's contingent upon the amount of water c customers are using. So as that water declines potentially in one year, that's going to be a, a more significant impact on the revenue than it would be if that was an entirely teal uh, uh, bar chart, or sorry, pie chart on the revenue side um, where all of our revenue is coming from fixed charges. Now, I would never advocate for that. Um, I think there's more equity in the system if you're charging customers based on the actual demand they're placing and how much water they're using. Um, by using a fixed charge, you're disproportionately impacting low volume customers and subsidizing high volume customers by doing that. But it's very reasonable to have some of your revenue coming from fixed charges, but it is very much an inverse. I just wanted to, to point that out before we, we got too deep into this presentation. Um, I'll, I'll talk just really briefly about the financial planning process. Uh, don't worry too much about what's on this slide. I'm going to talk through it conceptually here. Um, we have developed a, a short and long-term financial planning model for the city's water and sewer departments. Um, 
we look at operating expenses, how those operating expenses are changing over time. We take into consideration the city's capital improvements plan, what uh, projects need to be undertaken, how much those projects are costing, um, and how we're going to pay for those projects. Uh, the city has done an absolutely wonderful job of going out and finding grants, um, finding outside money to subsidize and, and not have to burden the ratepayers more than they would have otherwise. I'm going to talk about that and actually show the impact of that in a little bit. Um, I think, you know, uh, I have some of my clients really going out and finding uh, a lot of money, but the city has done an absolutely fantastic job of taking advantage of, of grants and, and other funds that are not having to impact ratepayers. So we take all that into consideration, and that outlines a forecast really focus on the next five years. Once we get outside that window, the crystal ball gets really hazy. Um, focusing on the next five years, trying to understand how much revenue needs to get generate, generated annually to be able to keep up with inflationary impacts, reinvest in the system, do what needs to be done so the water and sewer department have the revenue it needs to do what it needs to do in terms of renewal and replacements and maintaining that quality of service. Um, we, all, we compare that against the revenues currently that are being brought in under the rates that are on the books today um, and see what the gap is and how much more of those revenues need to increase to be able to meet those expenses annually. Um, we also take into consideration something more along the lines of financial viability or financial, um, uh, financial policies, which is um, retained earnings or a reserve fund balance. Right? Um, you know, I think it's, it's a good thing to have a savings account as a household. It's a good thing to have a savings account as a water and sewer department. Things are popping up um, on, a, on a daily or a monthly or, or annual basis that are not planned for. Um, those very cool wet spring, summer, falls where the <coughs> consumption declines and, and revenue declines accordingly. It's nice to have a bucket of dollars sitting there so you can not have to deviate meaningfully from the financial plan that we're hoping to set forth um, and just do more moderate increases going forward. And that, finan that, that reserve fund balance allows us to do that. So we take that into consideration as well. And you're going to see that here on the coming slides. So I'm going to start with the, the water fund. Um, the revenue requirements or the costs associated with the water fund, I'll refer to revenue requirements or the overall costs, are increasing by about 14% from 2024 to 2025. Um, this is largely due to increased administrative costs, treatment plan costs, um, and debt service, again, um, almost entirely fixed here. Um, we do take into consideration this entire forecast, the capital improvements that need to be undertaken, the timing of those magnitude, how we're paying for them, um, any grants that the city is getting in. And it's, it, um, our plan here is contingent upon the city's water master plan. Um, and there are no use of retained earnings or that reserve fund balance um, in 2025 to offset the budget. So if we were able to dip into a reserve fund and offset that, the need for rate increases, um, that is not assumed here in fiscal year 2025, so we need additional revenue immediately. Uh, I'm going to show you that on the next couple slides and what that means in a more graphical format to, to hopefully drive that home. Council President. Council C4, Council Kilby. Thank you. Those numbers look really conservative. Will you agree? I mean, the number from 2024, right? Mm -hmm. Projected to 29. Mm -hmm. um, can you define conservative? I just conservative want to make sure we're, we're talking the same thing. Uh, fiscally conservative. As conservative as meaning modest. Um, Why do you need no, to let you it's one, right? We've got 24, one, two, three, four, five. It's five years from it's, now. Uh, it, I'm just saying that the numbers look pleasing to me as a, a councilor going to vote on yeah. monetary issues, but they look very conservative. And, and I, again, I think uh, the conservatism of this is partially due to, um, and, and maybe, maybe more than partially due to uh, the city doing a great job of getting grants and outside funds to offset what you know, would be additional debt service. That debt service would have been going up significantly more if that grant money wasn't there, if those outside funds were not there to be able to supplant or supplement the, the revenue I'm requirement. I'm not a negative counselor, trust me, a ne negative person, but it's, it's yeah. it, I hope those numbers, Mr. Frillin, stay true. Yeah, without Because it doesn't look going forward, it doesn't look like there's any, um, any, um, 2019 increases as much. Yeah, you know, and again, that, that's how this was structured. This this year uh, is is a year where, there, where there's an increase. Um, a, a lot of that is due to uh, both water and sewer, and we'll talk about this. We do not use retained earnings, which we always have in the past. 
uh, to subsidize our budget and subsidize rate increases. Um, so that's one thing, you know, and again, the other thing with the water too, when you build out these larger models like, like we do now and you look at the debt service and uh, debt service coming on board and starting to see some debt service, okay. you know, we started the water main replacement project back in 2000 uh, with 20 year loans that came on in 2003, 2005. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so you're starting to see eventually some of that shed off. So that's really when we when we looked and built this model, we looked to see how that was structured to be able for new debt service to come on when old debt service was coming off. Yeah, uh, well, I, I won't keep you. But what I meant, I, I I look at it as in a positive light. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hopefully, the numbers hold true. Is what I'm trying. Yeah, to say. I, I thought when you were asking conservative, you meant that they were overly aggressive, and no. uh, like we're we're assuming no. the worst case scenario. No, no, okay. Instead of filling right. my gas tank, I'll, please continue. Uh, Understood. Thanks. I'll uh, put ten dollars in. Gotcha. Um, so again, to to represent this just graphically here, uh, this the the bar charts of the columns going up and down on the chart are the revenue requirements of the overall cost broken up by different um, different categories of expenses. Operating expenses, obviously, uh, the teal, the light blue, PAYGO, which is cash funded capital, money getting generated out of rates on an annual basis to pay for capital improvements, um, any existing debt service in the whatever color, salmon, we'll call it salmon color. Um, <laughs> and then uh, proposed or new debt service to pay for new capital improvements in the, in the, in the yellow color there. Um, and then the line going across with the diamonds on an annual basis is the city's revenue if rate increases were to not occur over the forecast period. Now what you can see there, if we take that a step further, um, not, you know, that is an unsustainable position. We can't run a meaningful deficit like that every single year. Um, and we certainly can't do so uh, with no money sitting in a reserve fund. Um, very limited funds in, in retained earnings currently. That's why they're not being used to offset the, the budget as they have been. Um, anytime you're using retained earnings or reserve fund balance to offset a budget and you're doing so year after year after year, you're just building a larger and larger structural deficit that's a deeper hole to get out of. Um, I'm not opposed to using retained earnings to maybe smooth out rate increases annually, but to do so every single year um, and building that structural deficit is, is not supported by me and is not uh, financially responsible in my opinion. So we need to start doing something to go in the other, the other uh, direction here um, to, to build this, this financial position. So uh, what we're showing is a uh, Increase to the, the volumetric charge of 18% in 2025. Now this is, uh, differs slightly from the recommendation from Mr. Furland as I have some additional uh, cash funded or PAYGO capital in 2025 that he has uh, removed to try to negate the, this rate increase a little bit um, and try to maybe spread that out over the out years. Um, but this is fully funding what I uh, perceive to be the, the necessary budget and necessary revenue requirements in 2025. Um, with no increase of the fixed charge. Um, and then, although we're not talking necessarily about the implementation of rates in 26 through 29, again, I think it's best practice to look and, and determine with the best information we have today of where we're potentially going. And we're looking at about 5% thereafter in 26 and 29 um, with that 18% increase in, in 2025. Councilor Deanne, Councilor C2. I just have one question. Can you go to the slide before this, please? Mm -hmm. Nope, nope, again, one more, that one. So I don't know if you can comment on this or not. We had the ability recently, in the last couple of years, to invest $20 million in opera funding into sewer and water infrastructure. Had we done that, what effect would it have had on this? Um, I can't answer that on the fly. I don't know. I'd have to, to run an analysis to, to tell you. Um, but it would have impacted it. Sure. Yeah. It does. yeah um, off the cuff, knee jerk reaction, that yellow portion of the chart, the yep. proposed debt service, um, it's potential that that could have been reduced if you would have invested that $20 million and not had additional debt service coming on board. I don't know that to be certain, but that, that's my knee jerk reaction to that without being able to analyze it for you and, and you. know exactly how the, those funds would be used and give you an exact. Uh, I yield. Thank you, Council. Okay. Um, 
Move here towards uh, that same chart that we were just looking at, but with the increases factored in, an 18% volumetric increase in 2025, and then 5% thereafter, you can see that line, instead of um, being well under the top of the revenue requirements or the cost bars every single year, is immediately jumping up and meeting where we need to be in 2025, and then sustaining over the, the, next, um, the next four years in 26 through 29. Now, I will say this, I cannot predict the, the future with certainty. Um, the only thing I can tell you certainly is, is that our forecast is going to be wrong. We're trying to minimize how wrong that is. Um, and that's why I would, uh, I, I advise Mr. Furlan to look at this annually, update the model that we have, uh, we have developed for them, um, and just you know, update it with the best information year after year just to make sure this plan has not de been deviated from significantly or there's nothing that new that has popped up. Um, with that, those increases, you can see that our reserve fund balance starts to build back up and getting to a more reasonable level. Um, this is not anywhere near what I would like you to be in terms of the, uh, the target level of about 90 days of revenue requirements or about you know, three months or so of, of reserve funds sitting in a reserve. Um, but it is moving in the right direction, um, starting to build back up some financial sufficiency. We are talking about uh, some meaningful increases already um, to, to in all one fell swoop or even over a five-year period to get those reserve funds up to that target balance would be mean significant and meaningful increases on customers, which I don't think is necessary given some of the other, um, you know, decent amount of fixed charge revenue coming in. Um, there's, there's ways to mitigate the risks, and by just having more in a reserve fund balance than you currently have, um, I think is sufficient and something that we can continue to analyze um, on an annual basis going forward. I'll move over to sewer and stormwater. I'll try to keep this going as best as I can. This is going to be a little competitive, uh, repetitive. Um, the revenue requirements are the costs on the stormwater, uh, sewer and stormwater side are increasing about 12.5% from 2024 to 2025, um, largely due to increases in treatment plan expenses. Uh, again, not uncommon in the industry. Um, our capital improvement, this is also taking into consideration the capital improvement plan and the, the um, capital projects need to be undertaken over the next five year period, which is contingent or based on the city's sewer and stormwater integrated plan. Um, and very similar to the water side, there are, uh, there are no use of retained earnings assumed um, in the 2025 budget, which has historically been done. Um, same exact story here, at least from, you know, from a, a conceptual standpoint, running a deficit every single year without any rate increases, um, an unsustainable financial position, especially when you take into consideration the sewer fund balance, again, starting at pretty close to zero, uh, obviously not able to dip into that much further. Um, and without rate increases, that would go negative, require a general fund subsidy. It's as an enterprise fund that should not occur. Uh, we can't allow this to happen. We can't have negative money in a reserve account as, as much as, uh, it would be great if we could do that. Um, that's, that's not sustainable and not something we can, we can produce. So we need some rate increases to be able to get us out of this. The same, same uh, story as the water side. Um, our recommended sewer rate increases, we have uh, two options here, and I'm going to show you what these kind of mean in terms of, of customer impacts. They're going to have different customer impacts on different types of customers, low volume versus high volume. Um, first option here is a 23.1% increase to both the sewer volumetric charges as well as the stormwater fee, um, and then going up about 5% thereafter. Uh, the second option here is leaving the stormwater fee alone at 2024 levels, not increasing, um, and to generate the same amount of revenue, these are revenue neutral scenarios, the sewer volumetric rates would need to increase by 33.8% instead of the 23.1% if the stormwater fee were also increasing. So, can I just ask a question? 23% stormwater fee increase, what is that increase to the every homeowner? Do we have that, Mr. Fallon? Yeah, we're, we're going to get into that. If you, um, if you can just give me two more slides. Yeah, maybe maybe two or three more slides. Okay. We're going to get how into how that. How many slides do you have total? Uh, we're getting close, I promise. I'm just curious. I, I can't remember. Just curious. I'll go fast. Take um, your time. Explain it well. Just curious how many slides you have. Uh, the sewer cash flow here with the rate increases uh, that we just looked at on the prior slide, again, remedying the financial uh, situation, no longer generating a, a structural deficit in, in this fund, um, being financially sufficient, reinvesting in the system the way that's necessary, 
And then you can see that further indicated on the sewer and stormwater fund balance here and starting to build that balance again, not quite getting up to our target level of, and I should say there is no industry standard for what it should be maintained in the target. This is just based on my, uh, my professional opinion. I think moving towards that target over time, as long as you're moving in the right direction, is, is fully sufficient and, and the rate increase is necessary to be able to get up there in all one fell swoop. Um, would be meaningful and something to be uh, undertaken in a future fiscal year and not this fiscal year to try to remedy that immediately. So we'll get into the rates and customer impacts here. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide, actually. This is just when you see it in your packet, just for your informational purposes or when Mr. Furlan gets you this presentation prints it out. Um, you can see how the rates are actually changing um, from current uh, to, to fiscal year 2025, the proposed. Um, but what's, what's a better indication is actually looking at the customer impacts themselves and what a customer would pay in terms of a, a bill increase in a dollars and cents basis. Um, so I'll explain this slide. Um, this might get a little repetitive here because I have, uh, I think, five different types of customers. Um, this is a low volume customer using 800 cubic feet. Uh, 100 cubic feet or a CCF is about 748 gallons. With a 5 8 inch meter, this is your most common meter size in the city. Um, this is your single family residential home. This is your, uh, your smaller multifamily properties, duplexes, triplexes, um, with one ERU of stormwater. Um, this is about 18% of all of your bills fall at or below this amount, um, 8 CCF. Um, what you can see is this customer is currently paying about $571 per year for combined water, sewer, and stormwater service. You can see it broken out by the different components, light blue water, um, greenish sewer, and then the red stormwater. Um, with option one, um, in both of these options, the water rates are going up by the same percentage, about 18% on the volumetric side. Um, option one and two, just to refresh your memory, option one is sewer volumetric and stormwater are both increasing by about 23.1%. And in option two, only the sewer volumetric charge is increasing, the stormwater fee is not increasing. And what you can see here is um, in option one where both components, sewer and stormwater, both increase, that same customer's bill with the increases we're talking about would, would go up by about $113 per year. $28 per quarter, a uh, little less than $10 per month, or about 31 cents per day. That's a combined increase of about 20%. Um, in option two, where the sewer volumetric is the only component going up, not the stormwater fee, um, that same customer's bill would only increase by $87 per year instead of $113 per year, or about $22 per quarter, $7 per month, or 24 cents per day, and that's about a 15% increase rather than a 20% increase. Why you're seeing the difference between options one and two is that stormwater fee is a fixed charge. Um, that fixed charge, a low volume customer has no ability to control that. A high volume customer has no ability to control it. But that low volume customer, a greater portion of their bill is made up by a fixed charge. Um, so as we're pushing more into the volumetric, it's putting more of the onus on the higher volume customers rather than the lower volume customers. And as we're, um, as we're increasing only the volumetric and not the this, uh, stormwater, which is fixed, that's why you're seeing a lower bill impact, impact here um, in option two compared to option one. Do you have an option where if you had a stormwater increase, it would show what the rates would be for the low volume? That, that, that's option one, sir. Right. So option one would be a 23% increase to uh, stormwater in sewer rate. The option two is just increasing the sewer rate itself, no increase to the stormwater. And again, it, the reason that we went through when, when we built the budget this year, and you look at these slides, um, so this is eight CCF per quarter per year. So this would be a, a single family household, potentially two to three people living in this house. Uh, you know, a small duplex with maybe two people living on each side. 18% of our bills, and this was from last year's bills analysis, 18% of our bills fall within this category. So again, that's, that's the smaller residentials and, um, you know, things like that. So the people that may be, uh, you know, two people that, uh, you know, retirees that are, that are living in a household together, this is most likely what their bill is going to be. That's why we use we went with option two, it's less of an impact on those people. 
Flynn, why am I under the impression that when we created the stormwater fee, it would help the residents because a lot of businesses that are very low users are paying the stormwater fee at a much higher rate than the residents. Same, same rate, but much higher volume. Yes. Why? So, so again, in, as, as, as Ms. Fox said, when you get into the fixed cost, those impact the lower rate users by a higher percentage than when you get into the... So when you look at the stormwater fee and you look at the how it impacts a large user, you may have a large user that has a lot of square footage of impervious area. Correct. They have a large building. They have a large parking lot. And they use very little water. They use very little water. So that's So wouldn't that help the residents? Overall, they... If we increase the stormwater, it wouldn't. It, but you'd also be impacting the resident on the lower side too. So if you increase the stormwater, you'd be impacting them because you're adjusting their fixed charge, which is a lower percentage of their bill. When you implement the stormwater fee for the first time, and you're pulling revenue requirements away from sewer, and you're charging it based on an ERU basis, which is very typical for stormwater, it typically has a positive impact on lower volume, smaller properties, the typical single family. Correct. You already have a stormwater fee. When we're talking about both components going up by 23.1%, that's having a greater impact on that lower volume customer because that fixed charge or that new stormwater, or that stormwater fee isn't new for the first time. We're not pulling costs away. Um, it's having a, a impact there rather than pushing more to the, uh, the volumetric, which is being encompassed by those higher volume customers. I get it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Council C4, Council Oh, I'm sorry. Just off the top of my head, what, what's the option if there's no increase? Is that feasible? I'm just throwing out there hypothetically. It stays the same. Uh, do we have, I'm sorry, it, Council Clark. There's no increase. It's the same as it is this year. What, what, right. in what terms would be of the ramifications of that? The ramifications would be that the uh, Water and Sewer Department would uh, run a structural deficit, need a, a general fund subsidy to be able to cover its its operating expenses and debt service payments that are absolutely fixed and cannot be, you need to pay your, your debt service, unfortunately. Hmm. Um, there, you know, if we go back to this slide, um, in 2025, this is the sewer fund without rate increases, that sewer fund balance would go negative by in the millions. And that would be millions of dollars that would need to be somehow found within the city. Okay. Well, I, I can ask you off, you know, af after this meeting, but um, it was $25 when it started, right? Mr. Phil, like 35, 30, 35, 35 per quarter. And we all know what it was for. It was to clean up our responsibility through all that contamination. Um, so it's, so, I, get, I think I have my answer. So this was as a result of um, finishing off the project, I, I would assume, because it's not finished yet, right? No, it's, it's not finished yet. Again, the, storm, the stormwater fee is still in place. We're still moving forward uh, on a CSO abatement projects, uh, and we will be for a number of years. Okay. And forgive me if you already answered the question, how much longer do we have? So right now we need to make all of our CSOs meet the three-month storm, which they all do not. Um, the uh, latest uh, push from the regulators, uh, A, is to reduce that to zero discharges. Um, that's not what our federal well, court I'm sorry to interrupt you. Mike, uh, the simple question, how long, Mr. Furlan, are, are the taxpayers going to have to be paying for this fee and, until a project is complete. Maybe it's an impossible question. Yeah, I Maybe would. Maybe when a project's completed, and then, and then <laughs> it can be a, it could be eliminated. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah, foresee it. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Council. Council C5, Council <laughs> Oh, me. I thought you were done. It's <clears> never <throat> going to be eliminated, because by the time you finish the CSO project, you're going to have to spend the money to go back and redo what you started the in the beginning. The so it's going to be never-ending. But I think what the council president said, I, I agree, and I'm not sure that that slide um, showed that, Mr. Fox. But when we had done it initially with the stormwater fee, um, the stormwater fee, businesses paid like five cents per square foot or something, or preservious soil, whatever. And the homeowners paid on the amount of water that you use, so it was different. So when you did this analysis, 
did you get a schematic of the entire city with what businesses and what percentage, for example, hospitals, Bristol Community College, big supermarkets with big parking lots, are they separate than what the homeowner is paying? Nonprofits. Or nonprofits. We have the city's the entire billing file. Every customer in the system, no matter it's your largest customer or a small single family residential home. Right, but if you're looking at the large customer, uh -huh. that large customer, the water that they use is not gonna be a lot. It's more um, the, the land that they have, like a, a big shopping lot yes. or whatever, a parking lot. Uh -huh. So, but their water bill, it's not gonna be, this is what they pay in water and this is what they pay in stormwater, like homeowners. So when you did these figures, do you, do you look at, these are all the buildings in Fall River that we have that have large lots and they're paying for stormwater based on five cents or maybe now it's, it's more. But are those the statistics that you use or are we lumping everybody together? I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. Um, we, if, if you, Paul. Council, yeah, what, sure. he, what he explained to me was did, those are the statistics he used. Initially, when we implemented the stormwater fee, right. we received a large sum of money from people or from corporations that never right. paid into it. Therefore, it was an advantage to do that. Now, we're already receiving that money, so if you put a 23% increase, they're just going to pay 23% more, but the so homeowners are going to pay 23% more yes. as well. So the, the, the difference in cost is going to be absorbed by both people by 23%. Yes. So a homeowner that initially is just going to pay $35 and stop and shop that's going to pay $5,000, that's not going to, it, it's going to occur, but you don't get the savings as much because it's not new revenue. We already have that revenue. But so stop and shop, let's say their revenue is not going up on stormwater? No, it, 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 it is. In, uh, under okay. option one, yes, it is. It will, but okay. so is. But not an, an option two? An option two, the stormwater fee or stormwater bill on any customer would not increase. So any customer. So in option two, any large parking lot area, BCC, the hospitals, they wouldn't pay. Correct. Pay is more. that what you're saying? Pay more than what they're paying sure. today. They would pay more. No, they would not pay more. They wouldn't pay. Right. No, they, they, they wouldn't pay more. It's not going pay up. What, Why would they pay more? They're going to pay what they're currently paying. They're not oh, going they to pay. they will pay what they're currently paying. Yes. You're not just getting rid of it. They're okay. not getting rid of it. We're That's just not increasing the stormwater fee. It. No, we're not getting rid of it. And option two, the stormwater fee is just staying at the same level as it is in today no. in 2024. Okay. It's not increasing. I thought when you said they weren't going to pay, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Why are they not paying? Thank you. Please continue. Let's just hold off on the question now until they finish their presentation going forward. Just make notes if you have to ask any more questions. Yep, please. we're getting close. Uh, average volume customer um, using about a 13 and a quarter CCF, 5 8 inch meter. Again, this is probably your typical single family residential home. This accounts to or amounts to about 35% of all of your bills are at or below this amount. Um, same exact story here where not increasing the stormwater fee would benefit this cu customer, um, not by as meaningful amount as the low volume customer, um, about a, a, you know, a $12 difference or so in terms of the overall annual bill increase. Um, this customer is paying about $777 per year for water, sewer, and stormwater service combined. Under option one, we're both uh, the sewer volumetric and the stormwater fee both increased by 23.1%. That same customer's bill would increase by about uh, $156 per year, $39 per quarter, $13 per month, or $0.43 cents per day. In option two, where uh, only the sewer volumetric is increasing and the, and the stormwater fee is staying the same as it is today in fiscal year 2024, that same customer's bill would increase by about $145 per year, $36 per quarter, $12 per month, or about 40 cents per day. So those those two options are getting closer here as we're adding more consumption um, to a property. So just one yep. thing I want to say about that, that's the, you know, and you've heard me say here, the 53 CCF per year, what the average customer uses. Um, you know, we've gone back last year, we did a full evaluation over, uh, over 16,000 uh, accounts, um, and we, uh, <laughs> averaged out what the average household uses uh, and it came in under the 53 CCF that we, that we use. So this is what we've always historically used uh, as the average household um, and that's what uh, we proved out last year is the average household is typically below here uh, and I use household. Household is talking about, you know, a single family or a three family has three, three households in it. Um, 
when we look at uh, when we look at this particular slide and we say 35% of the bills are below this amount, that is bills. So a three family has one bill, a single family has one bill. So 35% of the bills that we bill out are below this, this, uh, this amount. If we look at a high volume customer using 32 CCF per quarter, um, this is about the 75th percentile of all bills. Um, so all bills are, are you know, 75% or 76% uh, of, of all bills are at this amount, uh, amount or below. Um, this is encompassing the, the low volume that we already looked at and the average volume. Here is where we see the, the tide turning, if you will, where option two, where we're pushing more on the sewer volumetric and nothing onto the stormwater actually goes in the opposite direction and is causing a greater bill impact for these higher volume customers. Um, so instead of a $312 per year increase on this customer where both components, sewer volumetric and stormwater are increasing, that same customer's bill would increase by about $349 per year um, if we only increase the sewer volumetric because we're recovering more from that volume. This is a higher volume customer using more rather than having you know just one ERU increase. So we're seeing at this point um, that the tide turning or kind of the break even point for where the amount of consumption and again, um, it's not unfair to say that the vast majority of your customers would benefit from not have, in terms of bill impacts, would benefit from not having a stormwater increase in 2025 and to get the additional revenue that you need solely from the sewer volumetric. Um, for the sake of not being repetitive, just quickly, here's a commercial customer using 100 CCF per quarter, um, a two inch meter here with four ERU. Um, very similar story as the, the high volume residential customer, um, slight in, uh, a slightly higher bill impact uh, in option two where we're only increasing the sewer volumetric and not the stormwater fee, um, but very, very close again. Um, but it, it does move in the other direction. Um, talking, you know, about a, a 20, 21 to 22 percent increase here, or, you know, right, right, uh, a little over a thousand dollars under both options in terms of an increase um, for that bill. And that's seven percent of our total bills accounts. Yes, v very, very low percentage of your total bills fall into this category, um, and even. Uh, lesser degree, your uh, institutional customer using about 800 CCF per quarter with a 10 inch meter and eight ERU of, uh, for stormwater infrastructure. Um, this is less than 1% of your total bills. Um, this customer would see about a uh, anywhere from a $9,000 increase per year to at a $12,000 increase per year, option one, option two, comparatively. Um, and again, because of the magnitude of the high volume, the magnitude of water consumption here on this customer, it is pushing more um, towards this customer by going by option two and only increasing this, the sewer volumetric charge and not the stormwater charge. And again, um, this is you know less than 1% of your bills. Uh, you know, just to, to reiterate, uh, option two would be preferable by the vast majority of your, your customers, and I, I believe that's why uh, Mr. Furlan made that recommendation. Um, <clears throat> wanted to look at a, an annual combined water, sewer, and stormwater bill compared to other communities. Um, what you can see is currently, uh, this is a, uh, an average residential customer that we were just looking at paying about $777 per year. Um, right in the middle of this chart, um, going up to the 933 with the rate increases that we have, uh, I've just walked you through, um, in 2025, the third from the right. Um, you can see that does move up on this chart, but I do want to caveat this with that the rates for these other communities do not take into consideration a rate increase that they probably will or very much should have also in fiscal year 2025. Um, so although you do move to the right here in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, comparative purposes um, to other communities, that is not taking into consideration any increase that these other communities might have. I also want to caveat this with saying um, I don't like doing bill comparisons. I think a community should do what's right for that community and not look to what another community is doing, um, especially when I work with enough of them in the Commonwealth to know that there are, even though there shouldn't be uh, for enterprise funds, there are general fund subsidies and some of water and sewer departments are being subsidized and so they're not billing their true cost of service um, because their money is coming from taxation. Um, 
could be another thing where a, you know a community has a very very high volume institutional um, or industrial customer that is you know subsidizing the you know the rest of the customer base or a meaningful amount of in, uh, industry um, that's subsidizing. There's a lot of things that could make uh, a, a bill comparison of this nature uh, a very much an apples to oranges comparison. So why do you use it? Because I'm always asked to produce it. Um, everybody at every rate hearing I've ever been at or our public hearing asks me, how do we compare to other communities? And I wanted to ensure to just be uh, forthright and, and outcoming um, about you know what the, the, the picture looks like. But I wanted to ensure that caveat. Yeah, because I, I, I agree with you. You can't compare communities to different towns. You can't compare yeah. Worcester to Forever based on their water consumption, because we don't know how they're paying, how they're getting it. I yeah. agree with you. Yeah, no, and it, it, like uh, like Mr. Fox says, you know, other communities, there are a number of other communities yeah. that take, and actually the general fund pays for a portion of their water yeah. and sewer. So with an enterprise fund, you can subsidize from the general fund and pay uh, for water and sewer enterprise funds. You can't use the enterprise no, I agree. fund to pay the general fund. But not not that I think, I don't think Fall River should do that. Uh, Fall River should sub-support itself within its enterprise funds. Okay, okay. thank you. Next. Um, comparison to other essential utilities in fiscal year 2025, um, this is just more for comparison purposes. If, if, if you're asking me um, what is more essential, you know, water or potentially a, a cell phone or a cable bill, um, I think it's just a biological fact that water is more important. Um, and you can see the, the percentage of, uh, you know, an, an annual makeup of, of other essential utilities in fiscal year 2025, you know, cell phone making up 13%, cable making up 24%, and water and sewer making up um, 3 and 6% percent respectively for a much more essential service, at least in my opinion, on my soapbox. Um, just to, again, like to, to put this in pers into perspective, um, you know, it's it's always good to to have these conversations and and talk about all that goes into providing water and sewer service to residents. Um, I think a lot of people just think, um, certainly I did before I got into this industry, that you just turn the handle and water came out, and you turned it the other way and water stopped, and you flush your toilet and it just left, um, without any knowledge of of all that really goes in and the all the expenses and 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 time and effort necessary to be able to provide that, and doing so um, with. I'm going to go to this next slide here, which I think is also informative. Um, doing so for less than a penny a gallon is, is pretty incredible. Um, so this is a cost per gallon for different liquids. Um, starting all the way on the right, um, a gallon of, of Duncan's coffee at about $25 per gallon. Gasoline um, hovering around $3. Milk around $3. Um, that's certainly if you're not buying the organic stuff that's on the low end, um, being conservative here. Uh, bottled water, you know, a, a more than a thousand times the cost of, of a gallon of water. You know, you can you can turn on your tap at your home, fill up a gallon jug for for less than a penny. Um, that that's pretty incredible, and and have it delivered to your home 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, um, and it's good, clean, safe, reliable, and quality. Um, that's that's pretty incredible service. Only the city of Fall River can produce that for for residents. Really quick, Mr. President, this is the most poignant uh, uh, slide. In a I'm good gonna, way? I'm going to hide this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that really puts things in perspective because we take water and sewer for granted. Very much so. We do. Yeah. It's no self-gratification. Yeah. It's just... Thank you. Um, do you want me to just jump to the, the impact of... Yeah. Uh, we had just some, some slides here on the, the water funding and the sewer funding that has been... Um, uh, has been secured. I wanted to, to show you, I know we're running out of time, so I just wanted to get to this punchline. Um, those supplemental funds, grant funds, use of ARPA, use of other funds um, to offset the need for rate increases, it did have a meaningful impact. So if we look at what um, a combined bill is going to be under the recommendations that we just talked about for an average customer, about $933 per year, and we compare that to what it would have been if those grants and those outside supplemental funds were not present, um, that same customer's bill would be about $118 higher per year, um, about you know $1,051 instead of $933. Uh, in my opinion, that's that's not an insignificant savings to the ratepayers, and I applaud the city for doing such a wonderful job of going out and finding these supplemental funds, um, rather than uh, just saying, ah, this is what our costs are. Um, it's it's apparent to me that the city is 
very much trying to, to maintain its quality, reliability of service, while at the same time trying to ensure that it doesn't overburden the, the residents as much as possible. Um, and I think this is, this is very much an indication of that. So with that being said, I know it's very long-winded. Uh, thank, so, thank you. So thank just you. Thank you. Great job. Council seat six, Council Ponte. Mr. Furlan, go ahead. Yeah, so just a little bit on that too. So we looked at the last five years of those impacts and it was over $70 million uh, that we got in grant funds into the water and sewer department. Between grant funding, ARPA funding, which is the council and the administration helped provide to us, <coughs> principal reduction in our low, uh, through our low interest loan program. So, so I, I just want to comment. I thought that was a phenomenal presentation. I think it was very detailed and a bring a, a new perspective into how important our water and sewer infrastructure is. And, and I want to just make a comment. I think we should recognize as a community one thing is that our rates are too low. That's what it comes down to. This presentation clearly indicates that, right? Now, I know that's not politically popular to say, but the audit that I would like to see, the analysis and presentation as one council that I want to see isn't in a rate assessment analysis. While this was really, really good and very, very thorough, what we really need to be talking about is a performance audit in terms of where we can save efficiencies, where we can save money, where we can find areas of opportunity here. The, the city of Fall River since probably 1995 has been using one-time money to balance their water and sewer budgets for years. You've used retained earnings, you used opera money. It's, it's just been a consistent theme because that, well, that's the most politically popular decision to make, right? But the, the true decisions that we need to be making as a community right now is recognizing our rates are low, just like our tax rates were low up until we started raising our taxes for years. The problem that we have is we have to really know what efficiencies we need to see in it, when it comes to your department, Mr. Furland. That's the, that's the presentation that I want to I wanna see. So where are we at with possibly doing something like that? So that's something that we can put together. I can tell you on a regular basis, um, we audit throughout our departments, um, you know, internally. Uh, we haven't had a formal performance audit done by anybody uh, in a number of years. I think the last time was probably 2008, mm -hmm. uh, potentially. Um, but I can tell you we're doing that on a regular basis, you know, as far as electricity usage and things like that. We work with National Grid on a regular basis. We get, uh, we get them in here to look at our equipment, see where we can make improvements. And, you know, we've done a number of projects over the past couple of years uh, down at the water plant, replacing all the finished water pumps was a subsidized program through National Grid uh, to improve performance on those. So we're always looking at those uh, uh, all the time. How much would a performance audit cost? Um, I would not know that off the top of my head. Uh, you know, that's something that we would In have to- In your experiences, uh, as, as great as this presentation was, what do you think something like that would cost us? Caveating this with, uh, please, please don't hang your hat on I this, won't. or, or uh, to do it fully, it wouldn't surprise me if it was $100,000. Right. So we, we have $23 million or something like that, I think the mayor said at the state of the city address, uh, address uh, in one-time money, I think, when it comes to our stabilization account. So I think if we're looking to try to find cost savings, I'd urge you, Mr. Furlan, to send a communication to the mayor as a department head asking for some money to do a true performance audit. Because if you haven't done a performance audit within your department since 2008, that tells me there ha you could do all the work you can and you're phenomenal at what you do, but you're only one person. And maybe because you're the boss coming down to one specific department, that area might be cleaned up a little bit better and there are efficiencies that you might not be able to see that we could find ways yep. to save money. Because how many times are we gonna continue to increase rates, which need to be increased because the rates are too low, because people have been supplementing their, the, 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 this account for years. I mean, we abolished the trash enterprise account years ago because it wasn't self-sustaining. Is this enterprise account truly self-sustaining? The answer is I think I can tell you no, it's not. It's only self-sustaining if the city of Fall River uses one-time money to balance its water and sewer enterprise accounts, which is the same exact discussion that we were having when it came to trash in 2016. 
So do we abolish the water and sewer enterprise account? I'm not saying that we do, hmm. but I, there's one enterprise account that I'm going to be screeching at, and it is our EMS enterprise account that brings in lots of money every single year, which is self-sustaining, that I think the city might be able to leverage a little bit more. So I, I, I don't want to get into this because that's not what yep. this was about, but as one counselor, <coughs> I, I, I would urge you to please send the mayor a communication. And if it comes, it's a matter of the city council taking a vote urging the mayor to authorize your department to spend $100,000 on an actual performance audit, I think we're going to find a lot of cost savings measures there. No, without a doubt, I would be more than happy to do that because if there are some found, they would be implemented you know, immediately. Uh, again, with that, if we're going to do a performance audit, I think uh, our indirect cost as well with the city should be audited as well. Uh, I would agree with you on that. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. you. Good point, Councilor. One thing is, <clears throat> I've already heard the, the, the amount, $100,000 to do this performance audit that the gentleman Fox said, don't hold me to that number. Yeah, so let's, let's try to, I, I'm not going to hold you to that number. Let's try to get Mr. Phil a more accurate uh, count of how much it will cost Without if a you doubt. put out this. So we'll know to do both the, uh, um, the audit um, and the um, the second one that you spoke of. Indirect cost. Indirect cost audit as well. Yeah. Because I think it, those are both crucial. And if there's money to be saved there, and, and let's find out what it's going to cost us to find that result, because I think it's a good point. Council seat six, Council Vice President Pereira. Um, there's only a, a couple of questions that I have. When you did this, Mr. Fox, I know that um, the sewer, did we fix, a, uh, did we get that contract with sewer yet? Uh, so Iolia, did we? Has that been signed? That has not been signed. Uh, it's uh, in the evaluation. It was still going through. We've interviewed uh, one of the companies. In the so we're not sure what their cost is going to be for the coming year. Correct. Both of we both both of them were very close within right. within budget. Uh, the one that I did plug into the budget was uh, was the higher cost to make sure that we were covered. I believe it was. Uh, only three. I did hear that there were two that had uh, applied for that. Yep. And one of them, I know there was an issue in Ohio, in the state of Ohio because I googled it, um, with being sold to somebody else after whatever. So I I did um, caution on that. The other thing is. Um, I know the salaries in the water department, many of the individuals who work, they have to have certain licenses, et cetera. And the way that the contracts were with AFSME, I believe, and they were connected with maybe um, some of the dispatches or, or different clerks, like they were out of rank. Did they figure that out to, to so do something there so that their pay was to the point that we could keep people? Yeah, in re I think you're talking in relation to uh, licensed water treatment operators right. uh, as well as our distribution right. staff. Uh, we did go through uh, last year with last year's a budget. Budget there was uh, <laughs> there was a side letter that uh, that addressed some of those. Uh, you know, um, is it something that everybody's still climbing the ladder regionally, other communities, and other places? Yes. Uh, are we getting to a more stable point uh, with our staffing? Uh, you know, two years ago, you heard me down here, right. and we had two shift operators filling four shift operator spots. Management was covering shifts. I was covering shifts. Uh, we're in a lot better place now. Um, you know, across so that side letter has been negotiated. That's done. That, that was implemented with with last year's okay, budget. Okay. So yes. those figures, when we looked at salaries, those salaries were included in the figures that Mr. Fox showed. Correct. And the last thing is. Um, when the new building was built up at the water department, we suggested at one of the meetings that I was at that we put solar panels in. Yep. Do they have solar panels? So the building does not have solar panels. The building was constructed with the structural load rating to have solar panels. The uh, internal electrical systems were designed to be able to put solar panels in. I'm working with National Grid right now, uh, looking at the best option. They're evaluating it. Uh, we're looking at solar panels on the roof and then also potentially solar panels behind the building, like the carport one, so you can park underneath. Well, and especially for the wastewater treatment plant and that, uh, you should be looking at solar panels for everything because it's going to cost you less money, solar, wind, whatever, uh, because that is a big cost savings. I know just regular homeowners, our electric bills have skyrocketed because the Department of Public Utilities, not the state legislature, but DPU, they plug in all kinds of things. We're paying now for 
people who have electric cars, electric cars getting a station for them. Why am I going to pay for that? But we're all paying for it. So it really saves a lot of money. So those are some of, I just wanted to know what some of these statistics were. Thank you. With that, I yield, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Tito? Basically, it's just a comment, and I know I'm being a bit of a devil's advocate. I can't help it. No disrespect. But because you put the chart up, I sat and I thought to myself, I need gas for heat. I need electric. I need water to survive in this life. I don't need Dunkin' Donuts, and I don't buy it. I can reduce my cell phone bill. I can throw my cell phone away. Ooh, not me. I, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. My cable and internet, I reduced it by $100 a month. So, so we as individuals can control a lot of expenses in our lives. Yep. It's the things we can't control that make it difficult. And then coupled with the fact that we <coughs> found out tonight trying to be good citizens and consume less water has cost us more money. <laughs> Everything else we conserve and we save money. So yeah. it's just a comment I needed to make when I saw the graph. To, to your first point, though, that you just conveyed the point I was trying to make, that a lot of these other things that people just purchase on a daily basis, they don't actually need. Mm -hmm. And it was more of trying to put the, the cost of water into perspective versus things that are, are a, a commonplace purchase for, for and I homeowners. One, one legitimate question. When I looked through the paperwork, uh, Mr. Furlan, it appeared that the base fee is not going up. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank that, you. That is how I structured the budget. Again, looking at the uh, looking at the graphs that were presented with those low volume customers and average volume customers, trying to impact them less. Okay. Because I did look for that. Thank you. With that, I yield. Thank you, Council Seat 6. Council Party, did you have your hand up? Yep, thank you, Mr. President. Um, how much money in opera money do you have remaining? 140000 130000 something like that? Uh, remaining, so... No, so it, most of it's committed right now. Um, remaining left... Uh, we have the water main project that's still out, uh, that's still undergoing. I believe we have... I think there's about a million left to spend on that project. Okay. Um, but it's already under contract. There is some capital unused idle money that I thought I saw in the quarterly update that your department does have utilizing. So I, I don't want, you don't have it and you weren't prepared for that time. Yeah. So Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion um, that um, the council uh, urge the Mr. Furland uh, and the mayor um, to begin the process of conducting or putting an RFP out for a performance audit of the water department with an effort behind improving efficiencies and trying to find ways where we can uh, save money within the department from a performance perspective. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get that done in anticipation of by the end, not, I don't, probably not by the end of the fiscal year, I don't know how long they take, but hopefully within the next six months that we have a, an actual performance audit. By, by, way, by way of you using your one-time money in offer or you take money out of the stabilization account, it should be done. Water so I, I, and that's in the form of, a, um, I'm sorry? Water and sewer? Imagine. Both, yes, yeah. absolutely, okay. yes. And, and you also want to include the indirect costs? I do want to, to Mr. Furlan's point and to your point, yes, and including the indirect costs as well. I make that in the form of a motion. I'll second, I'll second it. <laughs> motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Councilor. Thank Is you. that it? Thank you. I think there's no further questions. I want to no. thank all of you for coming down and a great presentation. As the council had mentioned, uh, we learned a lot. Um, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank I you. will get you hard copies. As well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That'll happen in the future too. <laughs> thank you. Can we refer the matter to the full council? I entertain a motion to refer to full council. Can motion someone make that motion? Second. second. Motion to refer to full council has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number three, in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 44, Section 32 of the Massachusetts General Laws, I recommend the following appropriation to your honorable body, that the sum of $1,062,707 be and the same as hereby transferred from the school appropriation from fiscal year 23 surplus revenue. Motion full council. Second. Motion full council has made and second. On the motion, council in seat seven, council proposal. It was just a quick clarification question on the change of the amount. It was amended. Um, yeah. You want to tell the boy, Madam Clerk? 
We, rec we received an amended. Um, I believe that the um, CFO received communication from the school department that it was not 1.1 million, um, and so sh the um, the order has been amended to reflect the new amount. Got it. Thank you. I yield. Thank you, Council. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. City Council meeting will begin in. Motion, motion, motion to, to adjourn, adjourn finance. finance. Motion to adjourn finance has been made and second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Motion carries. City Council will be convening Five two minutes for the regular council okay. meeting. Regular City Council meeting will come to order. Clerk will call the roll. Councilors Kadeem? Dion? Here. Hart? Here. Kilby? Here. Pereira? Here. Ponte? Here. Raposo? Here. Sampson? Here. President Camara? Here. Will everyone in the council chair please rise for a moment of silent prayer? Please remain standing for a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit this meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present, and not deemed acknowledged and permissible. Madam Clerk. Mr. President, the first item before Mr. you is President, a communication. May we take item 10 out of the agenda? Motion to take item 10 second. out of the agenda has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 10 will come out of the agenda. Council Prairie, you please come up to issue some citations. Mr. McCluskey, will you join her, please? I'm going to let, um, is this on? It is. I'm going to let uh, Mr. McCluskey, who does a marvelous job with the youth of our community, he, along with others, um, put together this program. And I want him to let you know what this is all about for our wonderful students that are here from Durfee and Diamond and Atlantis Charter. She should have told you you were going to do that first, right? Uh, oh, you thought I wanted him to say it. <laughs> Go ahead. Good, good evening. In 2007, Partners for a Healthy Community wanted a way to recognize the contributions and successes of youth in the community. So we developed the Youth of the Year based on the America's Promise Positive Youth Development Framework. Um, so this is the 17th year that we've done it. We always try to do it on Absolutely Incredible Kid Day, which is a call to action for adults in, com in the community to tell youth in their lives how important, how special they are. It's a three-part process. It starts off with a caring adult uh, writes the nomination of a youth that uh, highlighting some of their accomplishments. The next step is an essay by the youth. And then the third step for those who make it to that level uh, is an interview. And tonight we have eight of the nine finalists for Youth of the Year. Okay, we'll call them up. We'll call them up one at a time, and I'd like them to be able to tell you a little bit about themselves. Because when I was at this award ceremony last week, I was astounded at what some of these people are doing. Um, let's get Asia Royas from Atlantic Charter School. Hi, my name is Ayla Royas. I attend Atlantis Charter School. I'm a part of National Honor Society. I've been on volleyball team for four years, and I was libero for two of the years. After school, I read to second graders in a special education class. I plan on attending Worcester Polytechnic Institute for Architectural Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. Wow. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
I read them at the end. The citations are all basically the same. Be it resolved that the city council hereby extends its commendation to you, to all of the youth here, for a 2023 Fall River Youth of the Year finalist for outstanding accomplishments and contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maggie O'Donnell, <coughs> BMC Durfee, O'Connell, not O'Donnell, O'Connell. And I read last month to the kids. Good evening, I'm Maggie O'Connell. I go to Durfee High School. I am the founding leader of Cow Cares and I'm involved in other various clubs, including NHS. I am captain of the cross country team and captain of the basketball team, and I also play tennis. Next year, I'm going to Seton Hall University, and I'm st studying biochemistry and running cross country, and I plan on being a dermatologist. Inez Medeiros. Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School. Hi, Inez. Good evening, everyone. My name is Inez Medeiros. I attend Diamond Regional in the Graphic Communication Shop. Um, outside of school, I'm in NHS and THS, and I'm also part of a track team and cross-country team, and I've been captain for three years. Um, I have volunteered at my local church as a lector, and I've also been teaching kids jujitsu for a while too. Um, took a break because of track, but going to get back at it afterward. But yeah, um, I plan on attending Wheaton College or Bridgewater State to be an elementary school teacher. Rachel Lehman, Lima from BMC Durfee High School. Hello, I'm Rachel Lama. I'm a senior at BMC Deerfield High School. One thing about me is that I really love music. I play in five different ensembles at Derby High School. I wanted to talk um, a little more about volunteering because I really like it means a lot to me. So at first I started in NHS. So what I would do is I would just go around the city doing like little things like you know the Earth Day CD cleanup, or maybe I went and helped wrap Christmas presents. But eventually I became president of Interact Club. And through Interact Club, I like started my own project. So one thing I'm really proud of doing right now is we're gonna have like a cultural show and tell. So we're gonna have volunteers of um, from diverse backgrounds go to Spencer Borden, and we're also planning to do it at Durfee as well, and just have people present about their culture so that we can help promote just like multi-minded thinking. And that the whole purpose of it is to help. Um, What's the word? To prevent like microaggressions in the classroom so that, you know, maybe you're not hurting someone's feelings if you're asking like, oh, what's that? Like, like at lunch. So it's supposed to help um, just educate everyone. So yeah. <laughs> the one thing you forgot to tell them was your dream is to be a backup dancer for Beyonce. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, Elizabeth Kinane from Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Kinane. I'm a senior at Diamond in the Advanced Manufacturing Program. And I've been involved in uh, several clubs and sports at Diamond. I'm the president of student government, and I've played on the soccer, basketball, and tennis teams. Uh, next year, I plan to go to Mass Maritime for marine engineering and pursue a career in the Coast Guard. Eva Bandari, am I saying it correctly? Okay, BMC Durfee High School. I'm Eva Bandari, and I'm a senior at BMC Derfi High School. Um, I'm a part of National Honor Society. I'm a member of Interact Club. I volunteer at Youth Court. 
and I'm also part of their free screen team. My dream, my college is undecided, but my dream is to get a PhD and be, become a professor. I love her, she's so soft-spoken. <laughs> She'll make a great professor. Like me, I'm not soft-spoken. <laughs> Ishal Zara, did I say it right? And Ishal's from BMC Durfee High School and she was the runner-up this year. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashal, and I'm currently a senior at Durfee High School. I'm part of National Honor Society, Interact Club, Skills USC, and African Teaching Foundation. My goal is to attend Georgetown University. I actually hear back from them tomorrow. So my, yeah, my uh, intended major is finance, and minor is international relations to go pursue the dream of working at White House. Thank you. You'll get to the White House. You may not just be working there. You may be running the place. And the winner is Emma McDonald from BMC Durfee High School. Yay, Emma. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Emma McDonald. I'm a senior at Durfee. And I'm part of the National Honor Society. Um, Durfee History Abroad Club. I'm one of the founders of Kyle Cares slash Durfee Cares Club. Um, I'm also a player for Durfee Girls Varsity Soccer, swimming and track and field. And I will be attending the University of South Carolina in the fall where I will be majoring in marketing. You know, none of these ladies could do this without the support of other people. So to the village that has helped these children along the way, the teachers at Durfee, and the parents at home, I really applaud you all for doing such a wonderful job. And I know that these citations <laughs> took a little bit of time, and I'm glad that the council indulged me. But I think it's important for us to know these are the youth of Fall River. These are the youth that live in Fall River, and this is what they're doing. How these individuals can stay up with all their grades and play on like three different sports. My only sport was a cheerleader, so I just showed up for games. Track, I'd only run if a dog was chasing me. You know what I mean? So I give you credit for body and mind and spirit, and we are, I speak on behalf of all my colleagues, we are also very, very proud of you. Keep it up, come back to Fall River when you're done graduating. We need you here. And Christian, thank you for all the work that you do. Great job, Christian. Uh, Mr. President, the first item um, on the agenda is a communication from the mayor requesting confirmation of the appointment of Nicholas Christ to the Fall River Contributory Retirement Board. This was objected to at the meeting held on March 12th. Motion to adopt the appointment. Uh, I have to step out because I do collect a Fall River retirement, so I can, thank you. Second. Oh, what was your motion? I missed it. Motion to adopt the appointment. Oh, do I have to lift uh, no. or is it automatic? So. Motion to adopt appointment. Second. Motion to adopt as a main and second on the motion. Council seat two. Uh, would it be appropriate to have the people that were invited come down to speak at this time? As long as they don't violate any open meeting law quorums, and if one representative wants to come down, that's <coughs> fine. If they, we have three members of the board that's here, we can't have all three here and speaking. We can have one, possibly two, depending on the clerk. Can we have two, Madam Clerk? You can have two sit at the table at the same time. Three. The sitting three board is, is four. Board. So no, it's right. five. The sitting board is four. Yeah, but the board is a five. We understand we what the board is, but I'd be comfortable with having one individual come down, right. and if you have to have another one come down, then they can leave and switch seats. But 
I so do who do we have in attendance maybe is the question. I believe we have the director of PRAC. I believe we have three board members. Um, yeah. Director of PRAC can come somebody? down. One of the board members can come down. And then anyone else? The two Let's ministers can come down. I, I, as a point of information, Mr. We have Mr. to waive the rules, first of all, too. Yep. Motion, this motion is to waive the rules. Second. Motion to waive the rules. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Mr. President, yeah, point of information. Seat six. I believe there's an attorney that represents Perak that's here as well. <coughs> I would like him down to Did the he table. Come down? Please. Yeah, that's fine. There's no open meeting law violation there. I, I also think the administration needs to have a seat at the table as well at some point tonight. Okay. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, members of the City Council, my name is Bill Keith. I'm not an attorney. I'm not quite as impressive as the students over here. Uh, I am the Executive Director of the Public Employee Retirement Administration Commission, or PERAC, the state agency that regulates and oversees the state's 104 public retirement systems. I'm joined by uh, my colleague, Assistant Deputy Director Patrick Charles, who is an attorney um, and was most recently a Deputy General Counsel. Um, I'm here to speak about the fifth member selection of the follower of a retirement board. As a retirement board member, one is a fiduciary by statute and by statute must discharge his or her duties for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to members and their beneficiaries. PARIC has granted broad statutory authority to oversee the public employee retirement system, which includes issuing memoranda to interpret and fill in the gaps in retirement law. There is case law that supports this. Likewise, there is case law that supports that retirement boards must follow these memos because of the statutory grants of power to PERAC to issue such directives to ensure that the 104 retirement systems operate efficiently and apply uniform rules and policies. Mass General Law Chapter 32, Section 20, Subdivision 4 sets out the composition of retirement boards. For city and town boards such as Fall River, the city auditor, accountant or similar position serves as an ex officio. The mayor makes an appointment. There are two members elected by the membership of the system and a fifth member who shall be chosen by the other four who shall not be a retiree, employee or official of any of the governmental units in the retirement system. If the fifth member is not chosen by the other four members within 30 days after the expiration of the term of the fifth member, said member shall be appointed by the mayor subject to confirmation by the city council. In February of 2009, PERAC issued a memo to interpret the statute to ensure uniform application. It stated that each of the other four, four board members must be present in voting for a fifth member selection to be valid. In September of 2017, PERAC issued a second memo relative to fifth member selection. <coughs> this memo states that the selection of the fifth member is a duty owed to the board's members and beneficiaries, and every effort should be made towards an open competitive process. Pursuant to this duty and General Law Chapter 32, Sections 20, Subdivision 4, and 23, Subdivision 3, the Board should actively solicit resumes of interested candidates through a public posting or announcement. The period, this period should be followed by a documented review process and interviews of interested candidates. Finally, a Board should not abdicate its authority of the Board of Selectmen, Mayor, or City Manager by simply opposing a candidate in order to force a tie-breaking selection. This is a board function, and every effort should be made to perform its fiduciary duty. Only in the event that the board can't ultimately agree on a new fifth member should the process move forward pursuant to the statute. There is case law that has supported PERAC's position that all qualified candidates must be interviewed. According to board agenda and meeting minutes, the January Fall River Retirement Board meeting included revisiting the November vote for the funding schedule and then the fifth member. The November vote had supported a schedule that increased by 7.5% per year. At the January meeting, the city appointed members proposed changing the schedule to 6.1 for fiscal year 25 and then 7.5% thereafter. The vote did not carry with the former fifth member voting against it. The former fifth member then proposed a figure in the middle, 6.8%, and the vote carried 4 to 1. A notice of fifth member applicants had been posted in December. 
no applications were received according to the board administrator. When the former fifth incumbent fifth member expressed interest, he was nominated and seconded for a new term as fifth member. The vote deadlocked in a 2-2 tie. No further action was taken. Before the February meeting, another notice seeking fifth member applicants was posted. According to the board administrator and the February draft minutes that the board will vote on tomorrow, two applications were received. One was a letter and a resume from a current longtime retirement board member who had once served in another community prior to that. In addition, the candidate is a career municipal fi finance official. The other application was a letter of interest without a resume from a current assistant director of a retirement board. According to the administrator and the draft minutes, neither candidate was interviewed. Both appeared to be qualified candidates. So per PARAC memo 28 of 2017, they should have both been interviewed. The applicant who is a current board member in another community was nominated and seconded by the elected members of the board. The vote was 2-2. That was the end of the fifth member proceedings for the meeting. Based on the information provided, it appears that this fifth, fifth member election was a flawed process. No candidates were interviewed. It appears that two candidates were simply opposed rather than there being a stalemate between two candidates. It does not appear that every effort was made by the board to select a fifth member. <clears throat> As the issue of funding has been raised, I wanted to take this opportunity to discuss this point. Uh, municipality's payments to a retirement board is to be made in full by October 1st. If there is a different agreed upon payment plan, it should be reflected in the funding schedule to account for the retirement board's lost investment interest for the period after the due date. It is my understanding the city makes its payments to the retirement board in installments in October, November, December, January, and February, and that the funding schedule does not account for this timing of payments. Uh, this has cost the retirement board about $600,000 in fiscal 24, will cost about the same amount in fiscal 25, and it will cost close to $650,000 um, in fiscal 26. Uh, a retirement board may charge a municipality interest for late payments. I'm not saying they can or they will, but uh, they can. It's, it's possible. Um, so I hope this information is uh, of assistance to you and be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Councilman Cito. <coughs> Good evening, sir. Thank you for coming. Um, obviously not being familiar with all the rules, regulations, et cetera, um, it's very helpful that you're here. So I guess listening to you, my first question is part of the process is if qualified individuals apply, it's, it's um, they have to be interviewed? Yes. And nobody was interviewed. They chose to a interview nobody. According to the minutes that we were provided. Okay. And both... I actually, I have a copy of the letter um, for one of the individuals as to their credentials, et cetera. <coughs> and that's the one I believe that uh, you pointed to with the um, retirement experience who's been on retirement boards. Would there be any good reason not to elect somebody of this stature? He's a qualified speak. candidate. I can't speak to what how a board member would vote, uh, but he certainly is a qualified candidate. Question, I just have a question. Did you say earlier that both candidates were qualified? Yes. Okay, so you're both qualified candidates. Yep. Thank you. Um, but it's my understanding that one of them ended up not moving forward. No, that's incorrect. Okay, can you clarify that? And who, and sure. Oh, sure, certainly. Please try to speak into the mic as close as possible so we can hear you. Pull the mic a little. It'll come closer to you if you pull it to you. There you go. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Can you just state your name yep. and address all of you, please, for the record? So yep. My name is Michael Pasternak. I'm the board administrator. Um, I live at Fairway Drive in Somerset, Massachusetts. Thank you. Can the other two gentlemen do the same, please? Uh, Bill Keith, Maynard Street, Arlington, Massachusetts. I'm the executive director of PARAC. Patrick Charles from PARAC. I'm the assistant deputy director and I live in Lawrence on Steiner Street. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. So regarding the two members who applied at the um, February meeting, um, after our fifth member failed reappointment in January, I posted the opening to um, the PARAC website, as we always do with the fifth member. Um, in the meantime, we had received two, we received um, a letter of interest and a resume from 
uh, Mr. Spellman, I believe that might be the one you have that Bill is speaking of. The other one was from a Miss Medeiros. It was just a letter of interest. And when I had tried to reach out to her via email to you know, arrange a potential interview for the date of the board meeting, um, she indicated she was unavailable to do a meeting by phone because she was on vacation and out, out of the country. So it was pretty much impossible for her to um, interview that day, but we did have an arrangement for Mr. Spellman to interview if the board decided to so interview him. So there was really only one um, interview arranged for the day because the other person was unavailable to be interviewed. So I, I believe the director just stated that the selection process, um, if for no other reason, just the fact that no one was interviewed, uh, created a, a flawed process. You all agree on that? Yes. Okay. So if the process is flawed, um, I've heard rumblings of potential litigation. Does this process subject the retirement board members uh, to breach of fiduciary duty litigation? It's possible. Um, from all the information I have, um, I think people have turned this into uh, being against who's being proposed as opposed to concentrating their efforts on the process. And I believe if the process was flawed, um, they acted within the 30 days initially. Would that be correct to say? They didn't complete it. So at this point, are they outside of the 30 days? Yes. Even, yes. So the only avenue would be um, to litigate the process and would that be, would they be able to start over at that point? How does how does that how does that work? It's, it really rests with the mayor at this point and the city council. If, if I may, the the statute says that if the person the fifth member is not chosen by the other four within thirty days, the appointment goes to the mayor and city council. It does not have any options for the board to re-vote or to re uh, do the process. They have to go with whatever the original process was. And so it is now in the hands of the mayor and the city council. But it does have the ability to be uh, litigated. Meaning that somebody that's vested in the system could allege that there was a breach of fiduciary duty. Is that possible? Yes. OK. Because I, I have difficulties with a flawed process. Uh, you know, did people not take their responsibility seriously? Why wasn't the person interviewed? For me, there's a lot of questions, but uh, um, for now, I'll yield. Thank you, Council. Council C4, Council Kilby. Yes, just uh, for the record, uh, the retirement board does has an have an attorney, so I'd ask the clerk to read uh, his opinion um, into the record. Uh, I've done some research on this, but, but on my own. I am not corporation counsel, not the attorney for the retirement board, but I think it's important as a matter of fairness to have the opinion from the attorney from the retirement board which cites the appropriate statute in terms of, um, and, and as you said, sir, you're, you're not an attorney, you're, but you, I mean, you did a wonderful job, you should be. Um, so, but I would like uh, that read into the red record, Madam Clerk, please. And I apologize. Well, I didn't write it, but it's it's a little lengthy. But I appreciate everyone's patience. As a point of information, uh, this is the communication that we all have uh, that we received on our desks from Attorney Michael Sako, I believe. Yeah, Sako. Yep. Sako. Yep. Yep. Kirk will read it. This email was uh, presented or emailed to Mr. Pasternak. Um, good afternoon, Mike. As requested, what follows is the statutory and procedural process for selecting a fifth member to a retirement board. Can you speak Mass, up? Madam Clerk, can you speak up a little bit? Mr. Mass okay. General Law, Chapter 32, Section 20, Subsection 4B, sets for a retirement board's composition for a non-Plan D or Plan E 
city and with respect to the fifth member it states a fifth member who shall not be an employee a retiree or official of the governmental unit and shall be chosen by the other four for a term of three years if the fifth member is not chosen by the other four members within 30 days after the expiration of the term of the fifth member said member shall be appointed in a city by the mayor subject to confirmation by the city council or in a town by the board of selectmen there is no other statutory or regulatory requirement for the fifth member's selection. PARAC recommends that retirement boards advertise to seek fifth member candidates and to interview prospective fifth member candidates, but there are no, there's no requirement to either advertise or interview fifth member candidates. A retirement board possesses the power of the appointment for the fifth member only during the 30-day window that follows after the incumbent fifth member's term concludes. For example, if the fifth member's term expires on March 31st, a retirement board has until April 30th to appoint a fifth member. The vote by the other four retirement board members need not be unanimous. Rather, as with any other vote that a retirement board takes, only a majority vote of the other four members is necessary for any motion to appoint a fifth member to pass. As noted above, if the retirement board does not select the fifth member within 30 days after the term has expired, the power of appointment transfers to the mayor, who then may exercise that authority to appoint an individual to be the fifth member subject to the city council's approval. In my view, section 20, subsection 4B's qualifications still apply to the mayoral fifth member appointee. That individual cannot be an employee, retiree, or official of the governmental unit, which in Fall River means the city, which includes the school department, the redevelopment authority, the housing authority, and the Diamond School. The fifth member is intended to be the neutral member of the retirement board, as the four other members are comprised of the ex officio and mayoral appointed members and two elected members who must be a retired or active Fall River retirement system member and who are elected by the active and retired system members. As you know, since the board was unable to reach an agreement by and among at least three board members as to the fifth member during the aforementioned 30-day window, the mayor now has the authority to appoint the fifth member subject to the council's approval. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you. I yield. <coughs> Thank you, Council. Council C8, Council Sampson. So I just want to make sure I understand this correctly and for everyone watching at home the process was that the board takes a vote they took a vote the vote failed correct within that time frame they took another vote that vote failed we are past the 30-day window had that vote passed we for the first time wouldn't been questioned if there was fiduciary responsibility that would have passed we wouldn't be sitting here but we're here and it is in your opinion, and you are an attorney, sir. I'm correct, right? Yes, I am. You're an attorney. It is in your, we are here to vote on the appointment for uh, Nick Chris, if you know he's appropriate. You're saying that his credentials, you know, we've all looked into him, if he's appropriate. Is the process one that we're taking a vote on a legal process? And I think that's what we were concerned, some people were concerned about. It, are we doing what we're supposed to do legally? I don't, I'm, I don't, we didn't question that the selection is now with the mayor and the council, as that letter just said from Attorney Sacco. Yeah. The, the selection is with the mayor and the council. Um, you mentioned the current uh, appointment before you. I don't know who that is. I'm not privy to it. Right. Um, it doesn't make a difference. It's not my selection to right. make. Um, I would just counter what was said in the letter that, um, that the requirement to interview isn't in statute or regulation that's true but as i laid out parac is empowered with the um, authority to issue memos and boards are bound by those memos and in those two memos for our fifth member everybody's supposed to be interviewed um, and the the posting is supposed to happen as did happen to solicit applications so that part of the process to us is flawed and those are things that we come up with in audits of retirement boards and those are audit findings um, that would be an audit finding when we come do an audit of the Fall River Retirement Board. But in terms of moving forward, in terms of your uh, selection now, that's within your rights. It's the mayor's selection with the city council at this point. With that, I yield. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Council C6, Council Party. Thank you. Is there, um, 
who, who here represents the retirement board? So that would be myself. Okay, just yep. for because people at home might not know that. Yep. Okay. So and and you were, were you at that at the meetings in January? Because I believe he's the chair of the retirement board. Is that correct? No, I'm, I'm the executive director. I'm not a board member. I'm okay, kind of like the administrator, but okay. So you so you're here as a representative. Yes. From the retirement board. Correct. So in your experience, in your because this is pretty cut and dry at this point. I'm going to just be completely candid with everybody and belabor this. Should the process have been better? But before I get into that, you are at the meetings. Correct. And do you agree with the consensus from PARAC that states that the 30 days have elapsed and the, and, the, and the decision is with an appointment from the mayor verified and confirmed by the city council? Correct. I, I believe that to chapter 32 is fine. Um, the 30 days were triggered. When Arthur failed reappointment, which was January 31st, um, the clock started ticking that day. Um, we had our next meeting on February 28th, um, 28 days later. Kind of just went through the whole process. That failed reappointment, so by pretty much March 1st, um, we're here where we are. So why didn't we interview people? Why didn't that happen? So all I can say is, well, for one, we were only to arrange one interview. Um, since, since the resumes were presented at the meeting, um, everyone had time to review them. Uh, Mr. Kamara, who was chairing the meeting, because he is normally the vice chair, but Arthur failed reappointment, so Mr. Kamara chaired the meeting. He kind of read through the resume. Um, he kind of stated he found it impressive. Um, he made an offer to to the other board members to interview, and it just kind of fell silent. Um, what, what does it, what does it mean? Fell silent? Does that mean that vo well, there was a I, vote? I, you know, I think Chairman Kamara, um, Robert Kamara, asked the other board members if they wanted to to you know conduct a phone interview, and um, I believe James Machado said yes, and that was kind of the only response he had. So. So what there, there really seemed to be no indication that that an interview. Not yet. They're going to discuss a lot of actions from a lot of people. Let's finish, finish what you're saying, please. Go ahead. You can finish. Um, so when <clears throat> there seemed to be no interest in having an interview, um, Mr. Machado, to the best of my memory, um, reiterated a few of the points that um, Robert Kamara had said. And he made a motion to appoint Ed Spellman. And uh, Bob Kamara seconded that motion. And then it, it just deadlocked that two to two. Um, Can I close? She has, Council C6 has the floor. He's conducting it. So please be patient. Raise your hand. I'll call on you accordingly. Sorry, was there anything else, no, Mr. Pond? No, clarify that. No, nope. go ahead. What's okay. clarification? So there was a motion made for another candidate that wasn't interviewed? And it failed? Correct. Well, yeah, it just didn't, it stalemated, I guess. Yeah, so, so it failed. Yep. It's just a point of information, okay? Yep. Thank you for your leeway. Council C6, I'm so sorry. Counter there was a motion made to appoint a member who was not interviewed, yep. and An it applicant. failed. Correct. So now there's an objection from some members hanging their hat on the fact that Mr. Chris, or I don't care what his name is, Santa Claus, wasn't interviewed, and, it, and it, then we have. That's why we're all here. We you made your point of clarification, that. Council. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Council C Six. You have the floor. I, I would like. I think it's appropriate for very briefly for Mr. Kamara to come down to confirm what Mr. Pasternak is saying very quickly. Okay. Please. You want to make that motion? Thank I, I make a motion to waive the rules. Have Mr. Kamara come down. You can stay. Please stay. Oh, There's plenty make of seats. Make a motion. Hold on. Motion has been made, Mr. President. Motion second. to waive the rules for Mr. Kamara come down. Made in second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Come on down, Mr. Kamara. Um, there, Mr. Kamara. Just clarify what was said about you, Mr. Kamara. As was yeah, I just want to give a back to the, to the Honorable City Clerk for them to look at. Okay. Uh, that's, he's got the, and we can call in uh, Attorney Sacco for this, and, and 
James Machado, who's the other elected member, was there. That's actually uh, a little backwards. What happened was we first. Um, I'm not sure. Well, I'm just going to say one thing very clear. I'm not sure we have to go back as to what happened. I think we. Yeah, I think it, it's in, it's important because the chronology it speaks to to what the whole thing is because let it's me, being. Let me, then let me ask you one question. Before it's being you mischaracterized. So let me ask you one question. Yeah. The facts. The facts. Was there a vote to nominate someone and it did not pass? Yes. Or there no? was the first. There was a first. We got on it, and Mr. Machado actually said, commented on the, the depth of the resume. Then Attorney Sacco, and when, Commander, when they get my, to court, my, my he question will have is, to was testify. there a vote? Attorney Sacco um, actually talked about the, the fifth member being neutral. And before I took a motion on what we were going to do to consider that individual, um, I hesitated. The two city members didn't say anything, not at all. And we have two attorneys of both of those that will testify. They said absolutely nothing, and they abdicated their, their authority to push this into a. And it's got nothing to do with Mr. Chris. This is about procedure. Mr. Camaro. This is I'm about procedure. Mr. Camaro, hold on. Yeah. This is about procedure. You're absolutely right. And the procedure yeah. right now is a very simple question. Yeah. Was and there a I, vote? Well, to, well, let no, me no, finish. I haven't began. How can you finish? I t Was there a vote? to nominate someone and it did not pass, yes or no? There was a motion to consider someone's, and then I, then it was silence, they hesitated, and I offered the board the opportunity for a telephone interview. I said, this individual candidate is prepared to have a telephone interview and then come in for an in-person interview at a later date, and there was nothing. Okay. So, Mr. Machado and I are not going to go forward a procedure when it was obvious that the city appointees were not were going to vote no to abdicate their authority. This was a this was a conscious decision to get a mayoral appointee. And as Mr. Sacco That's said in his letter, That's your the fifth member is supposed to be neutral. And Mr. Sacco, I asked him a question and 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 asked the director of the board. When we got to this point, I looked at Attorney Sacco and I said, are you telling me that if you have any kind of appointment, and I, by the way, if you want to read that decision, it's the Dalla decision about interviewing people, and it's C, and it's CR 19-0013, which says that the it's a crab decision, I think, actually. I think the point of interviewing. That says we have to qual we have to, in we have to. Okay, you have to, you have and you didn't, to. And you didn't and do I, it. And I offered them that option, and they didn't take it. Thank you. Okay. Was there a vote taken to nominate nope. anyone? Yeah, there was, a, there was a vote taken with no interview, which tainted the process, and that's why we, that's why we were going to, this is going to be litigated. This is not okay. about the appointment. That's fine. Nobody is contesting the mayor's ability under that part of the statute. Okay. But there's a thing called, you know, information from a poison tree here. Okay. The fact is the process was not followed correctly. This is all about the process. It's not about Nick Chris, and I'll tell you right now, the individual that we had as a candidate has the most impressive resume I've ever seen, and if he wasn't interviewed, I would be arguing about the process. It, whether it's Nick Chris or anybody, okay. this is about process. This is about due process. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Kamara. Thank you. Appreciate it. So. Uh, I want to bring this into perspective for a moment. Sure. Okay. To me, there was a clear um, lapse in judgment or a lapse in decision making from the retirement board. That's the reality of what happened here. Okay. I remember years ago there was there was a play on words when it came to the city council acting uh, on. Uh, passing or taking action on a budget, hey, the mayor got us. We had it. It passed. That's the reality of where we're at right now. The retirement board had the ability to make a decision, and they didn't do it under their time period. That's what this is about right now. And can candidly, that's really not even what it's about. Because what it's about right now is the city council making a decision on who is gonna be appointed from the mayor's appointment. We don't send people up to the mayor, right? 
we have a decision before us now on an appointment that the mayor sent to the city council that says vote on my appointment. If we say no to this appointment, it's just taking the person who is, whether you call him qualified or not, doesn't matter who it is to Council Kilby's point, that a decision needs to be made. This is a flawed system and it's a flawed process that isn't our problem. It's a problem of those who were on, unfortunately, call it not politically popular to say, I really don't care. It's black and white, okay? And, and there was an epic failure in communication. There was an epic failure in the way this board conducted its business. You had until December to figure this out. We are in March. The mayor acted within the mayor's purview and within the mayor's authority to appoint this person. Am I correct when I say that, Mr. Pasenak? Uh, to some extent, I, I don't know about the December, but in December we did post the fifth member for the first time with Arthur, when Arthur Vienna was still there, um, and we received no applications to that first posting. Hmm. Um, so once Arthur failed reappointment at the January meeting, and there was, and there was no, no other candidates brought forward at that meeting. We then posted again the second time, and like I said before, it really narrows the window with right. the thirty days. So, I agree with you. It's, uh, you know, it's how an issue really with the law to right, some right, extent. Sure. Like but thirty days is not a lot of time. But how do we fix this going forward? Well, if if I may, sure. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that a city or a county can do is they can adopt a supplemental regulation that would allow PERAC to appoint the fifth member where maybe it would be more neutral or follow a slightly different process. Unfortunately, the retirement board does not have that supplemental regulation and that would take a combination of effort between the retirement board um, the city council and the mayor's office whenever, you know, if this were to happen. And I think one of the good things about having that supplemental regulation is to some extent it would protect the fifth member who really is a, the key member of the board, be it Nick Chris, I mean, it would offer some protection to him 10, 12 years from now. I mean, I think it would be a, a very wise choice of the board and the city council and the mayor to you know con look into this and consider adopting the supplemental regulation, and we probably wouldn't be here right now if if we had that. But, um, but again, any supplemental regulation would need to be pretty much passed by the city council. We, and I and I and I respect that position. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. We wouldn't be here if the redevelop if the uh, redevelopment authority if the retirement board did yeah. their job since January to today before the mayor's appointment in February. You could have called, they could have called a special meeting. Look, I tried, I, it was my second that got this to even be had right now because I wanted to get the facts and I'm getting facts from PERAC, I'm getting facts from the attorney that represents PERAC in a clear letter. Like, I, we gotta do the right thing here and the right thing is to make a decision on the facts that are available to us. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I am, I, I, we're all going to sit here and pontificate for a little bit, as counselors sometimes do. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I'm very nervous about the retirement system. I'm very nervous that, this, the, that there's three essential possible maybe votes from the, from the mayor at that time that says we are going to re, uh, refinance your schedule. But you know what? You should have knew it was coming. Like, like how, did, how did we miss this? So I, 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 got, I got to be honest with you. We have an appointment. We're not here to vote on policy. This isn't an ordinance. We're not here to talk about supplemental regulations either. That's not what's before us either. What's before this body is a decision as to whether or not Mr. Christ is a qualified candidate to accept from Mayor Coogan. That's it. The process and litigation is on the, re on the retirement board, and should the city have to pony up cash because they didn't follow that in litigation? Hey, we're all subject to litigation. That's it. Listen, I'm, I'm sorry, that's just where we're at. 
and I, I'm very disappointed, and I'm going to be completely honest with you. I've got friends on the retirement board. I've got friends that go to those meetings, and I hear from them. They've caught me in restaurants. They've caught me at, at the gas station. I got somebody that was talked to me this morning. This is wrong, but what's wrong is the elected members of the retirement board didn't do their job under the, under the, under the umbrella and under the time frame that they had. So, right, Hold on, please. I, no, stop. Please stop. We're conducting a city council meeting. If people are going to shout out from the stands, I'm going to have you removed from the chambers. We are not, we are, so I'm sorry, no, no, stop, I'm sorry. They're talking about the elected members. He, one council is making a statement right now. Please stop, Mr. Kamara, because it's not, you know better. Mr. Kamara, he can make the comments he wants. He talked about one council member. We're in a city council meeting. I will tell people to leave if there's another outburst. If there's more than one, I know people want to say things. I appreciate it. I understand it's difficult for everyone, but we cannot control what a council says, whether you agree or not. Not every time a council says something you disagree with, you're going to be able to come down and, and make your peace. It's not the way it works in these council chambers. Not during the city council meeting. And I apologize for that, but it's not my fault. Those are the rules that we have here, and here we try to obey by the rules as much as possible. Point of council, information, please, come please. What's the point of information? Point of information, there's four members. Two appointed, two elected. There's five members. No, right now there's four. Correct. Current two standard, appointed, two elected. I think we're confusing when we say the appointed members did this, the appointed members do that, did that. I believe it was not the appointed members that voted no. It was, I mean, it was not the elected members that voted no. It was the appointed members that voted no. Regardless, it was a two-two so, tie. whether it makes, but just to clarify. But the council just making a statement. Who? He's not trying to insult anyone. He's not trying to humiliate anyone. No, he's just trying, trying to make a statement. Him, I, I understand I, that. I, I get what he's saying. I get his point. The retirement board, in his opinion, didn't do his job. It's pretty simple. It's not complicated. Please continue. I, I, I've said enough. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council. Anyone else, or are we all good? Because I think we know this is a pretty much where it stands. I think it's been pretty clarified. Council C2? Um, can I make a motion to waive the rules to have Mr. Kamara come back down, please? For what purpose, please? To ask him if, he, if, if the board is planning on moving forward with litigation. It so doesn't matter. Important. They can do what they want. It, it matters to me. Move the question, please. It matters Council, to me. Move the question. Is there a second? Second. 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 Roll call. Mr. President, at a point of information here, yes. this is a lot of noise, okay? I want to make it crystal clear. This is to vote on the appointment of Mr. Christ. Yes. Correct. That is it. We are not here to make an opinion or make a vote as to whether or not this is a policy issue or an ordinance issue. Correct. We are here to decide whether we as an honorable body believe that Mr. Christ is a viable candidate to serve on the retirement board. That's it. Don't we, we can't muddy these waters. I just want the record to reflect that. I don't think it's been clear, so clear to me from the last council meeting. OK, just wanted to make sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Motion has been made and seconded. Roll call. The motion is to move the question. Councilors Kadeem? No. Dion? No. Hart? Yes. Kilby? Yes. Pereira? Ponte? No. Raposo? No. Sampson? Yes. President Kamara? Yes. Motion four, four. Fails. What's that? The motion fails. Motion fails. Do you still have the floor, Council? Uh, well, excuse me. The, the, I, I want to. The, I want to. Um, well, we're, now we're like that. We're at the retirement board stage now, Council. Now we're right back at. We're right back at where we were. The current. We're, we're no better than what they did. So the comments you made earlier really about they failed to do their job, you put us in the same situation. Well, that's not necessarily true. Well, the, the, the motion was to call a question to end the discussion, and as a point of parliamentary procedure. That's what we just did. Right. That, that was. It was a motion, Madam Clerk, to end to call the question. Was was it? That is not the. That is not the motion that is before the council right now to approve or not approve Mr. Christ. The motion to call a question was to end the discussion and not approve, that's not what is happening right now. So a point of parliamentary procedure is, my motion now is to approve the appointment of Mr. Christ to the retirement board. Motion. We had that motion had prior. That. Well, I'm making it again. I'm just letting you know, you, we just had the motion to adopt well, the ordinance well, before us. And so the motion was just to, it was move the what question is the vote on the issue okay, before fine, you. Okay, fine, Mr. President. So what is the definition? Procedure. I'm making the parliamentary procedure very clear. When you say move the questions, vote on the item before you, which was to nominate Mr. Chris, it was voted on and seconded, and then we had discussion. So All right, well, I'm motion to reconsider. Second. Second. Motion to reconsider is made and seconded. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? C2 opposed. Motion carries. Motion now, to adopt the appointment. Motion to adopt the appointment. Nicholas Chris has made and seconded. Roll call. 
On the confirmation, Councilors Kadeem? Yes. Dion? No. Hart? Yes. Kilby? Yes. Pereira? Ponte? Yes. Raposo? Yes. Sampson? Yes. President Kamara? Yes. Thank Motion you. Motion carries. Madam Clerk? Item number two is the mayor's request for uh, the transfer. Um, originally submitted as $1.1 million, it has been amended that the sum of $1,062,707 be in the same as hereby transferred to the school appropriation from the FY23 surplus revenue. Motion to place communication and file and adopt the order as amended. Seconded. Motion to accept. Place communication on file. Adopt the order. Has it made and seconded? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number three is a communication from the mayor and an order to accept the donation of 14 cameras. Motion, Motion to, to accept. accept the donation. Secondly. Motion to accept communication and file and adopt the, um, and adopt the order. Has it made and seconded? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Do you wish to speak on the motion, Council? Yeah, I Council just seat? want to say that um, with the Vietnam War, we did put a lot of cameras down there. The War Committee paid for them. But I will tell you, we have caught people that had painted graffiti under one of the benches and the Iwo Jima. It was through these cameras and the assistance of the police department that people were held accountable. So I'm glad we're giving them to the city. Motion is made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number four is the mayor's communication and the proposed FY25 budget for the emergency medical services. For the committee on finance. Motion for the committee on finance is made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We have the traffic commission making recommendations to amend the ordinances. Uh, motion to refer to ordinance committee. Second. Motion for the ordinance committee has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Committee on Ordinances and Legislation at a meeting held on March 18th voted unanimously to recommend that the accompanying proposed ordinance, accompanied by an emergency preamble, be passed through first reading, second reading, passed to be enrolled, and passed to be ordained with Councilor Kadeem absent and not voting. Motion to adopt the emergency parking. preamble. Second. Yeah. Motion to adopt the emergency preamble has been made and seconded. Roll call on the emergency preamble. On the adoption of the emergency preamble, Councilors Kadim? Yes. Dion? Yes. Hart? Yes. Kilby? Yes. Pereira? Yes. Ponte? Yes. Raposo? Yes. Sampson? Yes. President Kamara? Yes. Motion to pass through all readings. Motion to pass through all readings. Has it made and seconded? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Committee on Ordinances and Legislation at a meeting held on March 18th voted unanimously to recommend that the accompanying proposed ordinance be passed through first reading with Councilor Kadeem absent and not voting. Motion to pass through first traffic. reading. Motion to pass through first reading has a meeting and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Whereas ongoing violence with firearms within the city of Fall River is a public safety emergency, and whereas these tragedies negatively affect the emotional and physical health of those who are directly or indirectly involved, and whereas community safety is one of the highest priorities of all residents, business owners, and elected officials who serve the city of Fall River, now therefore be it resolved that the Committee on Public Safety convene with the administration and the chief of police to discuss ongoing community efforts to reduce gun-related crimes, identify any funding deficiencies that are affecting the progress of these efforts, Motion. and to review information that the Fall River Police Department offers to the public regarding Motion firearm safety. Motion to adopt. Second. Motion to adopt has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Whereas in the past there were reports provided by the Fall River Police Department to the public regarding crime data and analysis, and whereas there have been no reports after 2021 posted on the Fall River Police Department website or received by city councilors, and whereas there have been multiple violent crimes committed in the past few months in the city of Fall River, now therefore be it resolved that the city council request that the chief of police provide an updated report of crime statistics to the public as soon as possible. Motion to adopt. Second. Motion to adopt. Has a main second. On the motion, sponsor resolution, Council C8, Council Sampson. I just, I put in these uh, two resolutions because it feels that we have an uptick in violent crimes. Um, but we just don't know. We don't have, 
we have no data. We have a, a police department has a data analyst who does that for the department. That's her job. And we don't have any updates since 2001, not even on the website. I looked just before the meeting started to see if the department, the police department had it. And we don't have nothing since 2001. We, historically, the city had gotten um, one in the middle of the year and annually, and we haven't gotten anything, so we don't know what, so we can't tell our constituents if crime has gone up, if it's gone down, if it's worse. We have no idea because we don't have that, and so I put that in. Um, I did receive communication back that they are working on uh, 2022s, but, uh, you know, I, at any time we should have this soon. It should be available to the public for people to read. Um, I just find it, um, I'm a little bit beside myself that we haven't had any data from the crime analysts since 2021. And so I think that at this point, with what's going on, it's highly important that our community members need to know. People are, I know that I get calls, I'm sure everybody gets calls, what's going on, what's happening. So it's important that we're informed. If we're not informed, then we can't inform anybody else. So we need to be informed. So I thought these, um, given in light of everything that's happened in our community, in the last couple of months. It's very important that we stay informed and we know what's going on. Um, it's just, uh, it's, to not be informed to be in the dark is, is not okay for us and it's not okay for the public. With that, I yield. Thank you, Council. Council Seat 6, Council Party. Thank you, Mr. President. So um, I commend our colleague in seat eight for two fantastic resolutions. Um, I just wanna just make a quick comment here that I don't wanna lose sight of the city council's <laughs> subcommittees, right? So what I think we should really start doing, the purpose of the Public Safety Committee would probably be to have this meeting within their, within their, within their department on a quarterly basis, right? And any report would be re uh, submitted to the City Council for accepting and placing on file to actually get that. So if it's a quarterly basis, like we have our quarterly updates, it should, it should maybe be something through ordinance or something that is created that it gets referred and stays there yeah. for a quarterly, because what's gonna happen is, you know, God willing, after you know this vote we just had, we all might not be reelected ever again. <laughs> so, you know, there's a strong possibility that um, we have new people that come through and who knows who's gonna be the president or who knows who's gonna be the chair of the Public Safety Committee. So we wanna just make sure that this is something, the intention is to make sure the council and the community <coughs> are updated on the um, specifics to crime da data. And I think it needs to be something <coughs> on more of a quarterly basis. So whoever that ch chair is should maybe consider doing that, and keeping it within the committee. Yeah, the only, the only reservations I have with that is that if we're gonna be every quarterly talking about crime and crime in the city, I don't know any other community that does that. And I'll tell you, we do very well as far as crime in this community. I don't want to be sending out the wrong message that we have a chronic crime problem, that we have to have quarterly updates on crime. So the, the chairperson of the Public Safety Committee is more than f welcome to have a subcommittee meeting and have the police come down and explain what's going on anytime. And if we want to do it biannually or whatever, but I just don't want to have the where you have to have a meeting about crime in this chamber and the subcommittee on a regular basis because it just it, it's going to just trigger the wrong effect that we have overburdened with crime. But I, you make a good point, Councilor. Council C4, Councilor Hart. Uh, C3. Councilor 3, sorry. Uh, no problem. I, I did talk to uh, Chief Garvin, um, and we do, we do plan on having a lot of pu public safety meetings coming up uh, mid-April, and then in each, each month after that, at different locations throughout the city. So um, I talked to him, and we were gonna get together last Friday to, talk, to discuss the meetings, but there was a, a, maybe a week and a half ago, there was a shooting and the chief had to cancel our, our appointment. So I'm gonna get back with them this week. So you're saying in a couple of weeks we should be seeing a meeting? Yep, absolutely. Perfect, thank on, you. On not just what we're discussing tonight, but all overall different, different things. Yeah. And I think that's what the council's about. talking about, yep. overall. Yeah. Council T1, Council Kadeem. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> so I'm just curious, so we've got the crime statistics in front of us, was that as a result of the resolution that was put forth? Yes. I just, I just wasn't sure if it was a timing situation that we automatically get this and... No, I think that's what we're trying to get more of. It. Okay, all right. Thank you, I yield. Thank you, Council. Council C5, Council Vice President Pereira. You know, I mean, I look at the crime that's going on in the city and the shootings and the stabbings and, and people are alarmed by it because I've gotten a lot of calls. What else can the police department do? How else can we help them? I mean, years ago, a few years back, Every morning at roll call, you had a daily bulletin, kind of told you everything that was going on the night before. 
does that still happen? Does it not happen? You know, once a month, you got the statistics on how many guns they took off, how many warrants they served. That's not in this statistic that he sent. I'd be curious to see that. And if the chief needs more help in doing things, then how do we do that? We've got a lot of people retiring this year. We're gonna have more retirees. You have people leaving, going to other departments. I heard seven people went to the academy, five didn't make it. I don't know if it was physical agility. Um, and they had somebody in the police department. I think Galveo was even helping recruits to get that physical activity to see if they could pass. What else can we do? Because the summer is coming and it will be worse. <laughs> You know, it will be worse just because it always is in the summer. And I think the police department does the best that they can do with what they have. So what else can we do? And I don't know if I want the chief to come in here and talk about strategies, et cetera, but maybe a meeting with us so we have a better understanding of what are the needs, what are the problems, what does he see, and what can we do as a community to help? Because we need to do more. I mean, I just feel we need to do more. A lot of people that are coming into Fall River really are invested in the community, and that's heartbreaking to me. Crime is everywhere, Councilor. And but I will say this: of it's all, the, all over. of I all mean, that is taking place lately, yeah. the police department has done a remarkable job of apprehending all the individuals involved. So that's to their credit. They have. But and what else can we do to to help out? I don't know. You're talking, about, you're talking about preventative crime? Well, maybe, to maybe prevent it, for that, for that, for that matter, I, I, listen, FBI, I agree with Casa. Uh, but if we're going to do firearms. that, let's bring in the district attorney's office as well that works with I that would stuff love as that, well. Mr. So we can President. say, let's, let's make it a regional that. thing and say, hey, listen, what can everybody do that's helping to get this along? I would love that. So. I just think that, you know, maybe there's something else that we can do, or maybe there's something else that the chief needs. And you know he certainly doesn't want to ask more in the budget because we know that we're bare bones. about, I don't know. He'll tell you whatever the chief says. I would just like Manpower. to have a one-on-one -on -one executive session and put it out there. You yield, Councilor. Just my thought. With that, I yield, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor. Madam Clerk, <coughs> motion is well, Council C two. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that I think it was approximately a month ago. The chief held a public meeting in the community room at the police department for anyone in the community who wanted to go for this specific reason, to have the conversation so that people could ask questions, so he could explain, he could answer all the questions and let people know what was going on, what was being done. Um, it was pretty well um, attended, actually. Um, but that was done just about a month ago right at the police station. And um, I know that you had a commitment because he said he had called you and you weren't able to make it, but. I was out of town. Yeah. But anyways, he did have a meeting, so I just wanted to put that out there so people could realize he, he is doing things other than publicly. And, and to that point, I've been to neighborhood meetings where the police department is also mm -hmm. present there, given the statistics on what the shootings are and what they're not and who they've apprehended and what the, they, they have the, the data. Do you, Council? I yield. Thank you. Council C4, Council Kilby. <clears throat> I, I'm not supposed to sit on this. I realize how important this, and uh, I will confess I, uh, I see an uptick. Um, but uh, Chief Corbin did call me on uh, that, but he called me like, uh, gosh, I think it was like five, six hours before the meeting started. Um, and I know he's a busy, busy man. Our police are <laughs> super busy. But I, I'm, I'm going to recognize it. There is an uptick. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it, especially at this time of year. Um, and it's alarming. It really is. So um, I've been down this road before. I think we all have. Um, and it's uh, our council heart is on top of it. I have numerous conversations with them nearly almost every day, right? And uh, with the mayor as well. And so it, it's an important, a very important issue. And a communication probably with the chief and the city council through the public safety committee will, uh, will bear fruits. So I yield. Thank, Thank you. you. We all set. Anyone else want to speak? No, but I didn't get a call because I would have been there. No. Okay. So he called. You should have called me. Councilman C1, Councilman Dean. So I, I guess I just want to echo your, your statements. I mean, the crime, crime statistics are important, but I, but I think it's also important to note that, you know, a lot of the crime that we have is targeted crime, right, which is a lot different than not targeted. Right? Absolutely. Because I would be a lot, more, con lot yeah. more concerned 
if the crime wasn't targeted. Overall, though, just looking at the you know crime statistics from 2022 to 2023, and there's only a couple of months left uh, in the fiscal year. You know, crime total crime is down by 23.61 um, percent, less than 700 um, incidences, and in, in this. It's all broken down, violent crime versus property crime. So crime is down, right? So we can't ignore that fact. I don't disagree. There's been a lot uh, in terms of when we start discussing murder. Um, so 2022, three murders compared to, you know, this year, four murders. Uh, that's an increase of 33%. So anytime we have a murder, it's a, a significant concern for us, right? So, um, but when you start looking year over year, Right for for the most categories that we we have, they're all negatives. We have a negative four percent, negative twenty three percent, negative eleven percent, negative sixty five percent, negative twelve percent, negative fifteen percent. Arsons are up, you know, and I'm sure that's probably due to a lot of the uh, homeless encampments, things of that nature. So, you know, overall, I, th I think we need to make sure that when we're having these conversations, that we we recognize um, how the reporting is done. Some communities do not, to your point, do not report uh, their crime appropriately, right? So uh, we do a very good job of reporting our crime. So, so that in comparison to other communities uh, could potentially be a little bit higher too. So th there's a lot that has to be said um, during these discussions with, with uh, I guess, revolving around the crime to make sure that we understand it and, and we're getting the message out to the community um, to ensure that, you know, everybody, I, I think in a world where there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of just a lot of animosity and, and craziness that's taking place, whether it's on social media or whatever the case may be. Um, when you start looking at some of these statistics, it could be a very, it could be a lot worse. Um, a lot different and, story. You know, and we could be looking at other communities. So, you know, I, I, and that's to echo the administration, the city council that has been always supported public safety, the police department. Um, and and the, other, the other piece to it is when you start looking at this profession, you know, especially with the, um, Police reform, you know, the industry itself has, has changed significantly and it's become very, very difficult to find individuals who want to serve in the capacity of public safety, whether that be police, fire, EMS, um, and it's a challenge. And when you start looking at a lot of these um, departments, they are getting younger and younger and younger. Um, so the experience that you see in these departments, uh, that becomes a challenge as well. So I, I got to say, even with, I think, you know, probably um, I think when I was talking to the chief uh, by chance, it was like a, a third of the department is less than five years or something like that. So when you start looking at that statistic, that's, that's significant, right? So to, to know that that's taking place and to, and to see that, you know, we, where we are with the crime is a, is a, is a good thing. But I, I, don't, I don't disagree. I think it's a good resolution. I think these conversations do need to take place. Um, I think we need to make sure that we, we ask the questions of what's needed in terms of resources and the support and then you know, we figure out how we can make that happen. With that, I yield. Thank you, Council. Council C. A. Council Sampson. No, I just think that Council <coughs> Kadeem just proved the point. Having that data proves. I mean, I think for a lot of us, you turn on. It feels like you turn on the news, and like Fall River's always on the news. It's just always something lately. And without that data, you can't really back it up. You can't say anything. You can't really say if it's targeted crime or not because we didn't have the data. So. To be able to have that data that just came out, just I think it was it came out after the resolution, um, um, is very very important for us to be able to speak to the community, and the community to be able to have that. So, with that, I yield. Thank you, Congress. Next resolution, motion to adopt has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We have a number of citations. <coughs> motion to adopt. Motion to adopt the we citations, citations. has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Like the citations. Yeah. Yeah. What was that, Councilor? That's the, the mm -hmm. we're voting on the citations, mm -hmm. but I just want to add that Julia Hargraves from Durfee also um, won with one of the uh, contestants, mm -hmm. and she was unable to be here tonight. A lovely, lovely girl. Yes, she is. You know her? Yes, I do. So do I. Yeah, you know her. So, okay. Motion to adopt the citations has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Madam Clerk? Have the police chief's report? Motion to adopt. Second. Motion to adopt. Chief's report has been made and sec. Is there a second? Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We have applications for the renewal of auto repair shop licenses at 697 Pleasant Street and 2608 South Main Street. Motion to adopt. Seconded. Motion to adopt has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 
Item 13 is in order um, reappointing Alexandra Silva to serve as a member of the Community Preservation Committee. Motion, Motion to, to adopt. adopt. Motion to adopt has a main seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I have a number of claims. Motion to refer to Corporation Council. Motion to refer to Corporation seconded. Council has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Item 15 is a letter that we received anonymously regarding parking issues in the Danforth Street neighborhood. Second. Motion accepted and placed on file has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 16 is an application for a license to conduct a one day bingo on behalf of We Love Children Fund organization. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Motion to approve has been made and seconded. Madam Clerk, I just wanted to state. Just for people who are interested, since this is a fundraiser for We Love Children and the organization, mm -hmm. the location will be, I believe, at the Liberal Club? At, yes, yes, at the Liberal Club June, on 7th, June 7th. At the Liberal Club, 20 South Street, for people interested in supporting mm -hmm. We Love Children. It's a wonderful organization. Motion has been made to approve, has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item <coughs> 17 is a communication from New England Power Company. Um, regarding the SEMA 2 project's introduction. Motion to accept, place on file. Second. Motion to accept and place on file has been made. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Have drain layer applications. Motion to approve. Motion to approve the drain layers application has been made. Is there a second? Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Motion to take 19 through 25 together, please. Second. Motion takes item 19 to 25. Can the clerk please read items mm -hmm. 19 to 25 before we vote on it? Yes. We have minutes of the City Council public hearings held on February 27th, the Committee on Finance on February 27th, the regular meeting on February 27th, the joint meeting of the City Council and School Committee on March 12th, public hearings held on March 12th, Committee on Finance held on March 12th, and the regular meeting of the City Council on March 12th. To Motion to approve. We 19 through 25 has been made. Is there a second? Do we have to take the motion to take them together first? We did. We did. No, that. we didn't. I, I made the motion. Nobody seconded it. Second. We did second, second it and we voted on it. Okay. All in favor. That's why we did it. Okay. And she read it. So we can end it. The motion now would be to approve. Is there a motion to approve? Yes. <coughs> motion to approve. So moved. No, principals do make mistakes. <laughs> He's asking again, though. <laughs> motion to approve. Motion to approve is made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. That's all we have, Mr. President. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn is made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Aye. Meeting is now adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good job.